like to comment on items on our closed session, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note that there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely today, and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. With that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Holder? Councilmember Golder? Oh, you're muted, Renee. Renee, unmute. Hello. Oh, oh wait. Take... Were you guys talking to me? My volume was off. Yeah, we're okay. taking yeah. a roll. Council member Golder is here. <laughs> uh, Watkins? Here. Sorry. Vice Mayor Myers? I'm here. And Mayor coming. Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on items that are listed in our closed session? If, ta if so, please call in using the instructions on your screen. Please press star nine to raise your hand, and once you've been unmuted, you will be given ten mi two minutes to speak to us on these items. <laughs> We have one caller. I'm having some technical difficulties, though. Oh, hold on, Mayor. Because I didn't. There you go. There we go. Thanks. Okay. Uh, for the last four digits are 3300. Zero, zero. You are now allowed to speak. Please unmute your phone. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Serena Lynn, and I put in a claim for my vehicle. Um, and you should have it there. Um, my last name is Lynn. My address is 402 Owen Street, Santa Cruz. And um, on the day that they put out the signs, um, let's say um, no through traffic, and I guess it's for making it so that the streets aren't through. Um, it happened to be also a day that um, the city had a tractor trailer rig parked across from my house. So I not only had a car parked in front of my house, my car in the driveway, but there was also a tractor trailer in front of the house, and it was one, a big um, tractor trailer for what a tractor was on. And they were out working over near Dave's Market. And um, anyway, the sign got put right in my driveway, like right behind my car. And I did send a picture in, but I don't know if it showed really as clear as it was. And I'd been out there earlier, and I noticed the tractor, and I said, what are you guys doing? But at that point, I didn't notice the signs. And so then I went get in the car, backed up, um, and the sign was right there. Because I'm across from Plum Street. I'm right kind of where Plum Street comes out to Owen Street. Since that time, the sign has been moved I think that sign gets moved every other day, but you know, I just have to watch where it is. It's never been put at the place that it is now. I think that there's somebody that comes and kind of checks it out. But um, I went and got estimates for it from two different places. Um, one place that I've used before and another place that I haven't, and they both came like within 20 minutes. Within 20 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank you for your comments, and we'll, we'll consider these as we move into our closed session. Thank you. 
Okay, are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, on any item on closed session? Heather. Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go into the closed session portion of our meeting. And for attendees um, and anyone who also should not be on the line, um, if you can call back in uh, roughly around 2.15 p.m., we should be ready to start uh, our open session at that time. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band composed of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Uh, with that, we'll start our um, afternoon agenda with presentations. The first presentation, uh, yes. If, if I can, um, Elaine Johnson had to reschedule, so we won't be hearing from her the first presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, then we'll move on uh, to the second presentation, which is a proclamation declaring October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we'll be presenting this to Delphine Burns from Monarch Services. So we'd like to welcome Delphine to our meeting. And I'd like to start by just reading um, a few of the whereases of the proclamation and then invite Delphine to uh, say any words on behalf of, of accepting the proclamation. And so whereas Domestic Violence Awareness Month began as a day of unity event in October 1981 under the auspices of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and whereas Monarch Services was founded in 1977, when volunteers secured a grant to open a safe shelter, Mariposa House, and Monarch Services continued to grow to meet the needs for safe shelter and services to domestic violence victims. And whereas in 1987, Monarch Services became one of the first rape crisis centers to be funded in California and was instrumental in developing and implementing one of the first sexual assault response teams in the nation, currently serving 1,500 victims of domestic violence and sexual assault each year. And whereas mandatory social isolation during the current COVID-19 pandemic has left many survivors in homes that are unsafe and has fractured support networks that survivors may typically rely on to seek help or escape violence. And whereas Monarch Services offers immediate crisis response to survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking through its 24-hour confidential bilingual crisis hotline, and whereas it takes a whole community to end domestic violence. Now therefore I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2020 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the City of Santa Cruz and commend Monarch Services on its continued dedication to raise awareness and prevent violence in our world. Thank you so much, Mayor Cumming. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm Delphine Burns, Communications Manager with Monarch Services. We're really honored um, that October is officially Domestic Violence Awareness Month here in Santa Cruz. We really, really appreciate the recognition. It's so important. Um, as Mayor Cumming said, you know, domestic violence has 
gone, it has been reported more and has gone up during this time of isolation and shelter in place. So it's extremely important that we are recognizing that it's sort of a pandemic within a pandemic and um, you know, that it's not safe at home for everyone and that there are, you know, definitely increased risk factors for those who are experiencing domestic violence. Um, and with that, I just also want to invite you all. We are uh, hosting a webinar on the dynamics of domestic violence. It's tomorrow at 10.30. Um, it can be found on Monarch Services' website, monarchscc.org, or on any of our social media. Um, you can also feel free to call us, email me if you're interested in attending, but it will be exploring basically the deeper dynamics of domestic violence so then we can all help understand the red flags more and help our community and really be there if somebody is really isolated during this time and does reach out to one of us. So once again, I just want to say thank you so much for having me and for honoring Monarch's work today and proclaiming October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So thank you so much, Mayor Cummings and Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Thank you, Althine, and thank you, Mayor Cummings, for this opportunity to highlight that October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And Delphine, thank you also for your work on our Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. I know that you mentioned that uh, tomorrow there's an uh, opportunity to um, engage in a uh, webinar with a monarch, but are there other ways that the community can support domestic violence uh, prevention and support the work that you're doing as well? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. There's so many ways. Um, I think that we've been really focusing a lot recently on prevention work specifically, just because during this time, um, that's really important for people to be educated about, right? It's isolation is a tool that's used by people who cause harm to their partners um, to ensure that their partners are trapped in that situation and that they don't have resources as individuals to reach out to. So I would say number one, as I was saying, is really just educate yourself on the signs um, of domestic violence and also educate yourself on how to be a good supporter, a good ally to a survivor if somebody were to disclose to you. It makes a really, really big difference how the first person that a survivor discloses to um, responds to them, makes a difference in whether they'll report it, whether they'll ever disclose to anybody else. Um, so really just, even if you feel like you don't know what you would say or how you would respond to somebody in trauma, that's normal. It's, it's really hard, right? It's hard because it's emotional for them, it's emotional for you hearing from that person likely a loved one so take the time now before that ever happens to go and seek out those resources we have them on our website but even if you just search how to support a domestic violence survivor how to support a sexual assault survivor um, it's really important that you let them know that you're not judging them and they're not alone and it's not their fault and just taking those simple steps makes you a resource for them and that is really one of the most important things is that uh, individuals who feel isolated know that they can reach out and that they can reach out to um, members of our city and members of our community for help. And um, so the webinar will be a great resource on that. But I would say um, other than that, you know, look out for the work that's already being done in the community and see how you can get involved. There's never too many people involved. We appreciate volunteers at Monarch. We appreciate donations um, of time or financial donations. But really just, I think the first step is educating yourself so then you can be uh, a reliable ally or supporter to a survivor if anyone does ever disclose to you. Great suggestions, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you again for all the hard work you do, and thank you for, for being here to accept the proclamation today. Absolutely. Thank you all very much again. Okay. With that, um, we're going to move on to our next item, uh, which is a presentation uh, from Matt Niswanger from Adventure Sports Journal. Um, he's here to discuss the uh, 50K in 50 days ride against racism. And um, given that it was Biketober month, I thought it was uh, good to highlight some of the work that's going on in our community. And so I'd like to welcome uh, Josh Perlman and Matt Niswanger from Adventure Sports Journal. Josh, you're, you're muted. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members. Um, 
I want to speak about racism and the 50K and 50 Day Riders Against Racism project from a position of a privileged white male adventure sports athlete. I spent my entire life engaging in what is loosely what are re loosely referred to as adventure sports, sports that are generally you versus yourself in an arena where mistakes can have dire consequences. Big mountain snowboarding, high altitude mountaineering, rock climbs taking a week or more to complete, and of course mountain biking. If there's one dominant characteristic that I've recognized from my early years of scaring myself, it's that this is a bunch of white dudes doing white dude stuff. Where are the people of color? Where are the women? Well, there has been a surge in inclusion and recognition of women in the last decade or so. Very much has not been the case with people of color. In fact, I cannot name off the top of my head a single African-American professional snowboarder, skier, climber, mountain biker, kayaker, or surfer. Now, let's fast forward to just a couple months ago. I'm on one of my many weekend rides with Matt Nicewanger, one of those ones where you ride most of the day, enjoy a frosty beverage after, and try to forget about adult life. During these rides, we have many banter sessions relaying stories of our youth and exciting moments in our lives. During, <clears throat> by the end of the day, we always wind up talking social issues, the latest one being that nothing says white privilege like mountain biking, and climbing, and water, and snow sports. It was on one of these bike rides where Matt said to me, I have this idea. What do you think about a 50K in 50 days bike challenge? We have 50 days to ride 50,000 vertical feet. First, I thought, wow, that's going to be tough. And then I got really excited. The immediate next topic was how do we use the event to raise awareness for funds and funds for racially inspired social justice movements without seeming to jump on the BLM bandwagon simply for attention? How can we make a difference? Matt came up with the idea of Riders Against Racism and the gears began to turn. So at this point, I'm gonna pass it off to Matt. He's the man with the plan. Before that, I would just like to commend, uh, thank you for your time and commend the city council for leading cohesively and with a conscious and vision during these last few months. Yeah. All right, is Matt on the line? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, great. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so just to add to uh, what, what Josh said, um, right now we have about uh, 25 riders who are attempting to uh, climb 50,000 feet on their mountain bikes in 50 days. So they're actively on Strava and then um, posting it to um, the, our website and um, just keeping track of our mileage. So we're, we're, we're building a community of anti-racist um, mountain bikers. Um, and so that, that's really 50% of what we're doing. And the other half of what we're doing right now is um, something that started for me this summer. Um, <clears throat> I just finished uh, this book right here, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, and, and, and was really struck with um, this notion from the author that you know, we have to go out and find racist policy and fight against them. Otherwise, we're just having a conversation. We're, we're, we're just, you know, really talking to each other and arguing on social media. So um, right then I found out from my um, sister-in-law about this siren that goes off, off every night at 6 p.m. in uh, Minden, which is right next to Lake Tahoe. And it's a really popular area for mountain bikers um, in the Carson Valley there. And every night this siren goes off. And um, so apparently the, the Washo, the native people of the area have been asking since 2006 if they could, if the town of Minnie could stop this siren because the siren for decades coincided with a law on the books in Minden um, that all Washo people had to be out of town by sunset every night. Um, and so when I found out that, that the Washo people have just been saying, hey, you know, you can run your siren uh, anytime, but just the 6 p.m. one that happens every night uh, you know, can we, can we please put a stop to that? And um, for, for one reason or another, um, this, the town of Minden has been saying, you know, we're gonna keep this siren going. So, so that's, our, that's our policy challenge. That's what we're working on, Riders Against Racism. Um, and so um, I, th I think probably the best way to, um, you know, communicate um, kind of the, the emotional pain of, of this sundown siren that's still happening uh, every night in Minden, Nevada, right next to Lake Tahoe, um, is to play this video. Um, this summer, uh, as soon as I learned about it, I started a, a petition um, that got about 10,000 signatures in two weeks, and that is to just stop blaring the uh, 6 p.m. siren every night um, in Minden. And um, 
So here, here's here's what came out of this uh, just started. It was a, a news story. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, it, it, it's heartbreaking that a siren goes off every night um, in, in, in an area that many people from Santa Cruz go to, to mountain bike and, and enjoy the outdoor recreation, Lake Tahoe, and it's still happening today. So um, we're, we're building a community of anti-racists, and uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to work hard to stop this siren. Um, and, and so uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, Mayor Cummings, really appreciate it. And... Uh, Thanks, thanks for the chance to tell you guys about it. And Matt, before you go, is there, do you guys have a website of where people could sign up or get more information on this, this ride or other events that you all are putting on? Yeah, you can check out um, uh, ridersagainstracism.org is our website. Thanks. Uh, Council Member Brown. I just wanted to say thank you for coming to our meeting and giving a presentation and all of the work that you're doing. I really like what you said, Matt, about um, being an anti-racist, meaning that we go and we find uh, instances where policy has, um, you know, the, the, that element of, of racism, um, and we, we try to change that. And, um, you know, I teach a class, uh, and my students learn about uh, you know, slavery. They learn about you know the history of racism in uh, the United States, and they're always surprised when we read a piece about sundowner towns and that there were um, historically more in California than any other state in the country. And um, you know, we we tend to think of it as something that happens out there in other places, and 
And so I think it's um, really important that we look uh, closer to home and um, and in places where we recreate and um, enjoy ourselves as well. So thank you for being here and for all of your work. And um, I'll check out your website as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. There's no further questions. Thank you all for coming. And we're going to continue on with the rest of our meeting. And good luck on the rest of that ride. Thank you. Okay, I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard on only items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items will be open, that will be open for public comment today uh, uh, during this meeting are numbers 9 through 30 on our agenda. Uh, with that, I'd like to ask uh, to the city council members if there's any statements of disqualification today. Councilmember Matthews. Go ahead, Councilmember Matthews. Oh, you're, oh. Uh. Okay, uh, I need to disqualify myself from item number 30 because I have a, a property within 500 feet, feet of the um, proposed location. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions. Um, no, the only one was the presentation number the number four, item number four. Okay, thank you. I'd like to make a quick announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public uh, to speak to us on items that are not on our agenda today. Oral communications will occur on or around 5.30 p.m. And so if you'd, wish, if you'd like to make a comment during oral communications, please call in around 5.30 p.m. this evening. Uh, next item is the city attorney report on closed session. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on, a report on a closed session. First, I'd like to check the sound. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Mayor Cummings, members of the city council, good afternoon. Um, this afternoon, the council met in closed session uh, virtually at 1 p.m. to uh, discuss the following items. Item one was a conference with legal counsel uh, involving liability claims. Those are the claims of Serena, Janice, Lynn, James L. Chrislock, and Jesse Grant Wilkinson. Um, those uh, matters are also listed this afternoon on your consent calendar as agenda item number 14. Uh, secondly, the council received a report from the city attorney's off office on a matter of existing litigation. Uh, the case is entitled The Regents of the University of California versus the City of Santa Cruz. Um, this is a lawsuit filed on October, 30th, uh, on October 13th, 2020 in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Uh, the lawsuit alleges that the city has a legal obligation to provide water service to portions of the UCSC campus that are currently located outside city limits and also outside the city's current water service area boundary pursuant to the terms of two contracts entered into between the regents and the city in 1962 and 1965. Um, under ordinances adopted by the council in 2008, it is currently the policy of the city not to extend city water and uh, services to the university beyond its existing limits without the prior approval of the local agency formation Co commission, which is required by state law for all amendments and extensions of service outside of a jurisdictions uh, boundaries. Uh, moreover, it is current city policy not to initiate an expansion of the city's water service area with the, locate, uh, the local agency formation commission, unless authorized to do so by approval of a ballot measure to this effect by city voters at a general or special municipal election. Um, city council received an update on the case uh, in closed session this afternoon, uh, which is very, in its very uh, preliminary stages uh, insofar as the city was only served with the lawsuit on October 14th and has yet to file responsive pleadings. 
Um, so it's premature to comment on the merits of the case at this time, but the council did receive a report um, and gave direction to the city attorney's office. Uh, lastly, there were two items of potential litigation involving significant exposure to litigation in which the council received a report from and gave direction to uh, legal counsel, but there was no reportable action on those items. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next item is a city manager report. So I'd like to call on the city manager report and provide updates on uh, city events, business, uh, city business, and uh, other information related to COVID, uh, the fire complex, and other events. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just gonna do a quick update on the uh, current status of our county with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic and where we are with the, uh, the state parent system. And uh, I'll share my screen really quickly just so you can reference the, the chart and if there are questions, um, I can answer those. But I'll, uh, I'll just do a summary rather than going through each, uh, each item. Uh, but if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. So uh, today the county announced uh, that the state had officially placed the county in the orange tier in its uh, blueprint for safer California. And this is based on improved positivity tests and case rates in our county. Uh, so beginning today, uh, previously opened uh, sectors like restaurants and churches or places of, of worship, movie theaters and museums can now increase their indoor operations to 50% of capacity. Uh, they were uh, formerly, uh, most of these were at 25% capacity. Uh, in the case of retail, they may now uh, fully open. They were at 50% capacity, as you can see here in this chart. Move these along a little bit here. Uh, bars, uh, breweries, and distilleries uh, may resume outdoor operations. Uh, they formerly uh, could not do that. Uh, wineries may resume also may resume indoor operations at 25% or 100 people. Uh, whichever is fewer, and also gyms and fitness centers may increase indoor capacity to uh, from 10% to 25%. Uh, I'll show those here. And then uh, in the other uh, major areas to show here, previously restricted sectors such as uh, museums, I'm sorry, amusement parks, family entertainment centers, non-essential offices, and live audience sports may open with modifications too. So that affects us with respect to, for example, the uh, boardwalk. Uh, and then the county did note that although movement to the orange tier is a sign of reduced uh, disease transmission in our community, uh, COVID-19 cases are rising uh, nationally. Uh, that we, as we see um, in these reports and are expected to increase locally as we move into the winter. So uh, we must not uh, stop doing what we've been doing uh, well here in our town, which is uh, to continue wearing face coverings, practicing social distancing, and avoiding uh, large gatherings and, and large groups. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, moving from one tier to, to the next, uh, allows uh, for more openings and for increased capacity, but still uh, maintains uh, all these other, these restrictions in terms of good safe practices to prevent the, the spread of the disease. And then I'm happy to answer any questions you may have on these. I didn't to go through every single item, but uh, just wanted to be, provide you with a brief overview. Great, are there any uh, questions for the city manager? Relate to those openings. Councilmember Watkins. Uh, yeah, I think if, if there's a viewer who's watching and wants to track sort of where we are as the county, where do you suggest they access this information and, and figure out how to best monitor our stage? So there's a, the county has a really great website uh, where they update every day, uh, where they update, uh, and you can just Google Santa Cruz County uh, COVID-19 and it'll take you to the specific links uh, where you can see all the cases uh, and you can get very uh, accurate information about the daily increases as well as the demographic data, uh, as well as hospitalizations, deaths, uh, a lot of, of really great information. The state also has a very good website. Uh, also you can Google uh, State of California COVID-19 Safer Economy 
and you'll see the information around the, their blueprint system uh, where you can uh, track statewide uh, each of the different counties and where they're at and the different requirements under each of the different uh, uh, colored categories as well. So there's lots of really good information on our county website. Uh, our city website also, if you Google under our uh, website, you can also find links to all of these other websites as well as some of the, the specific, uh, uh, whether it's executive orders or conditions or requirements that we have in our city. Thank you. All right, um, are there any further questions for the city manager related to COVID? Okay. Oh, actually, there was one other quick uh, update I wanted to provide uh, just for the general public and for the city council. Uh, the one item that we're also working on very uh, deliberately right now is on the relocation of the bench lines, which uh, you've uh, uh, received some uh, information about. And uh, we are continuing to work on that. Just this morning, there was a meeting of the two by two committee that is comprised of uh, Mayor uh, Cummings and Vice Mayor uh, Myers, as well as Supervisors uh, Coonerty and McPherson, uh, along with staff. So the uh, the committee is meeting to uh, essentially uh, formulate a uh, relocation plan. Uh, there is agreement that the uh, that the uh, encampment managed encampment needs to be relocated, and that the there is not a desire to reduce capacity, to maintain capacity, uh, and also to create a system of, uh, of, of diverting uh, clients also so that there's capacity that is available on an ongoing basis as uh, uh, the need uh, uh, is there. Um, and hopefully we will have an update for you here soon. The expected closure uh, or relocation is expected uh, by the middle of November. So we hope to have an update for you here in the coming uh, week or so. Okay. Are there any questions from council members? Okay, hearing none. Um, is there anything else you'd like to update us on? That's it, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the council meeting calendar. And so I'd like to now call on the clerks to provide any updates to the calendar. Thank you, Mayor. There are no updates, but just a reminder, we have those, a couple of special meetings, one on the 29th and one on November 4th. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, the next item up on our agenda is our consent agenda. Uh, these are items numbers 9 through 24 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you'd like to comment on items numbers 9 through 24, now is the time to call in. The instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star 9 to raise your hand, and listen to the cue saying that you've been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who would like to pull any items or council members who have question on, questions on any items? Council Member Matthews. Actually, not to pull, I want a quick comment on the previous item number eight, which is the calendar and the study session. I think I brought this up before, but um, these deal with really huge issues going into the future for the council and there will be new council members. And so I would hope that the, um, City Clerk and just uh, extend the invitation encouragement to all of the candidates to tune into those because, you know, we'll make the decisions that Catherine and I will be. <laughs> so um, the candidates should put that on the agenda. <laughs> all of them. Thank totally you. agree. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, the council received a request this morning to pull item number nine. So I'll do that. I'll go ahead and do that. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. I just have a question on item number 18. Um, if staff is available, um, I recall that we had submitted um, a grant, I believe it was at some point last year uh, for the Riverway and I was, for the Riverwalk, and I was wondering if this is the same grant or if this is a different grant. 
Yeah, um, Councilmember Myers, you have Claire Gallagher, our transportation planner, and Noah Downing, our parks planner, on here. This is for the same grant program. We were not awarded in the previous round, so we got feedback from the grant program managers and they're resubmitting for the same two projects. Great, thank you. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your persistence. I appreciate it. <laughs> I have a. I have a question on item number 24, and so I'm wondering if there might be someone from the water department. Um, just notice that the um, the water rate revenues, it says that we're approximately 3.8 million less than projected. And I was just curious what might have kind of led to that. Is it, you know, the fact that, you know, with all the students leaving, that's, you know, almost a quarter of the population that's gone from the town, and or what other factors might have led to us having such a huge shortfall? Yeah, um, so uh, the students leaving and the, um, the businesses shut down and the schools, and so imagine a lot of water use that happened in a non-residential setting all of a sudden transferred to a residential setting where people were you know, uh, sheltering in place. So we did see an uptick in residential demand, uh, but we also saw this sort of quite marked about a 10% reduction in total demand, uh, particularly in the business, uh, the, the business general, the business hotel, the business restaurant, and uh, the uh, sort of university and sort of schools, those kinds of things. So the, um, the rate stabilization reserve fund is, was really put together for exactly this kind of very mm -hmm. unforeseen circumstance. And uh, our decision in this round was anyway to uh, go ahead and um, transfer funds from that. It still leaves us with uh, around 8 million in that fund. The, the goal is about 10 million. So um, that's the current status. Thanks, and then I, I guess, you know, based on what we've seen this year, if we don't see, you know, a full reopening next year, we're likely going to have further um, challenges with with rates. Um, well, I think I think that we're not seeing things are sort of stabilized in terms of some of the business uh, use in particular. Uh, we're not, you know, clearly the the uh, being able to serve food outdoors has been underway for quite some time. Uh, not having the the boardwalk work at all um, during much of this year has, you know, brought fewer people and to the tourists into the town, even just for the day kind of thing. So, um, you know, we're monitoring the demand very, very carefully. Um, we do have some, you know, flexibility and we're just keeping an eye on it. There's not really much we can do about it, right? Um, but yeah, so we're watching it. Okay. Um, that concludes all my questions. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? Okay, so seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. Um, this will be on items uh, numbers 10 through 24 on our consent agenda since item number nine has been pulled. So if any members of the public would like to speak to us on any items on our consent with the exception of number nine, now is the time to call in. Once you've dialed in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you've been acknowledged, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Seeing no members of the public who'd like to call in on this item, I'm going to bring it back to Council for action on consent items with the exception of item number nine. Council Member Matthews. Yes, I'll move uh, consent items number 10 through 24. Okay. Motion by Council Member Matthews. Council Member Watkins. I'll second the motion. Okay. So we have a motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Watkins. I'd like to call on the clerk to uh, conduct the roll call vote on this item. I'll, I'll add another comment while you're distracted there for a second. Um, 
so often the consent agenda is looks routine, but when you look at what's in this consent agenda, we have energy conservation, we have park improvements, we have long-term water supply and financing improvements. Uh, as is so often the case, the consent agenda is just a testimony to the city's good long-term work. So congratulations to all departments. Sorry, are we ready for a vote now? Yes. <laughs> Council Member Byers? Council Member Byers, did she leave? She's, yeah, she had to step okay. away. Uh, Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye, so that motion passes um, with Council Members Brown, Golder, Watkins, Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, and myself voting in favor, and Council Member Byers absent. And so let's move on to item number nine, and then uh, we're going to need to take a short break after that item. Um, so let's go ahead and um, Council Member Brown, since you pulled that item. Yeah, thank you. So I, um, I think I've followed along. We have this item is there are three executive orders that have been issued and are coming for um, uh, uh, ratification. And I, we received the city council, I think everybody received a message this morning asking us to pull this item. So I'm doing that. I've said in the past that I would do that upon request from the public. And um, so that's really why up now. And so I hope that the folks who wanted to comment and talk about it uh, are around for public comment now. Okay. Are there any other comments by council members before we move on to the public? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll go ahead and open this up for public comment. So if you're a member of the public who would like to speak to the council on item number nine that's on our consent agenda, now is the time to call in using the number that's on your screen. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And after you've been acknowledged, you'll need to unmute your phone and you'll have up to two minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Hey, um, this is uh, Reggie Meisler calling. Um, so, this set of executive orders, I'm so glad that Sandy pulled this off, is maybe one of the uh, worst combination of executive orders I've seen yet. Uh, order 2020-20 uh, evicts food not bombs after their 200th consecutive day of serving meals to the houseless during COVID-19 and displaced houseless persons living nearby. 21 extends the racist vendor ban indefinitely uh, with no update on the mediation process that was supposedly happening. 22 and 23 are yet more displacements, uh, destruction of donated tents and survival gear, and just uh, 23 was obstruction of food not bombs at the lot they were told to go to after being displaced uh, from lot 27 in order number 20. Um, and so a lot of people are gonna talk about food not bombs. I wanna talk about 21, um, just cause I'm not sure how many people are gonna call in about that today. So earlier today, there was an anti-racist uh, person who was delivering an inspiring story about how people need to like, not just be not racist, but anti-racist, which means actively fight racist policy in their community when they see it happen. And I think this uh, executive order is an example of a racist policy. In fact, Shebra Kalantari Johnson, not even part of a candidate uh, slate that I support, um, said it was an example of a racist policy in Santa Cruz when asked during a candidate forum. Um, I mean, this policy was crafted again uh, after a Latinx woman who was a vendor at the boardwalk was assaulted by a racist white business owner and then police chief Mills went on TV to defend that violent crime based on the notion that this woman was unlicensed. Now, this is clearly unacceptable and it's unacceptable that we do not get an update on the mediation process. We don't, it, it seems almost 
unimportant whether the mediation was over or not, or like what happened with it, or what the rule changes were, or whether, you know, people's needs are being met. I mean, Latinx families have been forced to survive without this income for over a month, and now we're served this executive order that just indefinitely increases this vendor ban that is incredibly sweeping. And I just, I just don't understand how people on council can consider themselves anti-racist and allow this policy to continue. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, so, are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on item number nine? If so, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to speak. Four digits are zero seven one one. You're able to speak. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I can. I'll um, break wondering, are we still um, discussing the issue of food not bombs? Uh, item number nine is executive orders, so we're not speaking about food not bombs, but we are speaking about executive orders that might relate to um, food not bombs. So. Okay. I was hoping to speak in support of um, food, not only food not bombs, but just to kind of piggyback off of what the last commentator was saying um, in regards to Santa Cruz being a, quote, sanctuary for these people who were vending and others like them. Um, it's kind of a, you know, pretty much an oxymoron to say that we are a sanctuary and we are in support and, um, and then go and handle these issues like they were handled by uh, the Santa Cruz Police Department. And um, I think that statement is kind of a blanket statement that could be said also for the situation with food not bombs when we're talking about unhoused people, human beings who should be treated with dignity and also human beings who are treating them with dignity and feeding the community um, in these you know, unprecedented times. Uh, you know, there's no reason why we should be playing uh, you know, musical unhoused people. You know, it's just kind of chasing our tail here. So I think that I have full faith that the community of Santa Cruz and the board can come up with a better plan of action um, to support um, all of these community members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next caller. I'm calling um, uh, against the city trying to shut down uh, food not bombs, um, that being something that the city manager, Martin Bernal, um, can do uh, with that agenda item. Um, food not bombs provides a lot of services for houseless people, and this is an attack on the houseless community, which has been happening a lot throughout the past couple of weeks. Um, so if you all really care about the people, then you would keep these services open. Thank you. Okay. Hi, um, this is Becky Steinbrunner. I've just joined and I'm not sure, are you still discussing the consent agenda? Uh, we're only on item number nine. The other items that were on consent have already been passed. Oh, all right. Thank you. I missed the event. Um, thank you. I'm sorry to disturb you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Okay, 
next caller. Your last four digits are 4847. You have been asked to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that um, this executive order is a little ridiculous that we're asking for um, people distributing food and for houseless people to just be moved around everywhere. Um, I think it's pretty clear that, um, you know, we're trying to help out these people and, um, it just it just seems like the city's actively trying to stop that. Um, I think that the city should, instead of passing these executive orders to close parking lots and, and move people around, they should be you know, helping out with distributing food and distributing resources to people who really need it, you know, amid a, a global pandemic. Um, I think it's just ridiculous what the city is doing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Seeing no further members of the public who'd like to speak to us on items on the agenda, on the consent, on item number nine, I'm gonna move it back over to council for action and deliberation. I see one more hand up. I don't know if that person's that, already spoken. That person's already spoken. Okay. Seeing no further Members of the public who'd like to speak to us on these items, I'm going to bring it back to council for action and deliberation. So, Council Member Brown. I actually um, just want to ask a question um, about the uh, vendor, uh, extension of the vendor um, prohibition, number 21. Um, so, uh, a public a speaker suggested that um, there, we're not getting a report about the progress, that, if any, that's been made uh, with Community Bridges agreed to uh, step in and try to have, uh, you know, facilitate that conversation. And so I'm just wondering if there has been any progress there um, before we take action. I can, I can do a quick update. Uh, uh, yeah, so Ralph uh, in my office has been working with uh, Ray and the uh, street vendor representatives, and they've had several meetings uh, with the staff, and so they've uh, uh, developed some uh, uh, agreement that uh, they'd like to create a system uh, where they uh, can know where to operate and when to operate. So they're currently working out, trying to identify how they could uh, create that system, where they could operate, uh, with the idea of having a system that is sort of fair for the vendors so that, because there, there's some dynamic there within the vendors in terms of who gets a place first and when. And so just developing a system that's sort of fair for the vendors themselves, because it's very competitive in terms of, and limited in terms of the spaces, as well as complies with all the other sort of requirements that are needed just to be able to create a safe environment, you know, plenty of room, and all the various sort of operating conditions that are needed to, to operate in, in a really limited congested area. So that's being worked on now, and there's, as I understand, there's a consensus that they would like to have that, that they'd like to have an organized structured system rather than the kind of uh, free system right now that is creating some, some challenges both for the vendors themselves and as well as the the, the individuals that are visiting the beach uh, and, and, and adjoining businesses. So that's where they're at, and uh, uh, the, uh, the goal is to have that system uh, up and operating before the council here in the coming months. And if I could just follow up. So um, given that progress, was there was the, uh, making an indefinite extension of this ban? I'm just wondering what the purpose was of doing that if there is a system that's being worked out? Uh, I think the idea was just to tie it to the, the existing, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a permanent, it's just to tie it to the existing um, uh, emergency declaration so that uh, 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 it, doesn't, it doesn't have to come back. Uh, uh, however, when, when a system is in place, that will replace the uh, this uh, uh, executive order. So the idea is that it just allows us 
you know, the time to develop the system, and once it's in place, then it'll it'll replace it without having to come back and, and update it on a regular basis. So it was just to simplify the process, essentially. But the meetings are ongoing, as I understand the, the uh, uh, and also the the uh, the period that is uh, obviously the busiest and what the vendors want to be able to be down here is during the, the busiest season of the year. So right now it's not as busy, uh, although we still are having some vendors come out. Uh, uh, but that's the idea. And are they being cited? Uh, not, no, no. I have I have not heard that they're being cited. I think if people complain, and uh, they're obviously, as has always been the case, people are given notice and, and uh, notified. Uh, and citations only occur if uh, there's non-compliance. But uh, it, again, it hasn't been a problem. And again, it's only been when it's been problematic when we've had issues of congestion or uh, are there other uh, uh, impacts to the uh, the area or to uh, visitors in the country. One other question uh, about the um, the kind of situation, uh, food not bombs, distribution of food. My understanding was um, that the move from lot 27 across the way was going to provide an alternative space where food not bombs could continue to operate. And so I'm just wondering, it sounded, I didn't see it in the, um, in the documents, but it sounded like from the, one of the speakers that, that that they're being moved from there as well. Can you? Um, yeah, I? no, I can clarify. Uh, yeah, let, let me let me clarify that. So, Food Not Bomb has a permit. Uh, they've been given. They didn't ask for one, but we gave them a permit nonetheless to operate at Lot 23, where they're currently operating. Uh, and they they were also allowed to operate on Lot 27, and also previously. Uh, they were given a permit to operate at the bench line. So there's been some folks that have said that we've never let them operate or given them a permit, and that's simply not true. We have multiple times. And the city has only intervened whether they had a permit or not when they created nuisance conditions where they operated uh, uh, in a way that did not comply with requirements such as social distancing. And after receiving numerous complaints uh, about their operations, uh, which uh, unfortunately has happened repeatedly, uh, and so, if, you know, again, if NISH's conditions were not present, then it would not be a problem. Uh, of course, the last thing we want to do is to enforce on an organization trying to provide a public service. Uh, and uh, so we would like them to, you know, operate like most uh, many, many uh, nonprofit uh, poor serving organizations do, which is uh, without creating sort of nuisance conditions. And again, it just got to the point where it was severely impacting adjoining businesses where they were not able to operate, you know, the correspondence and feedback that we've seen from the credit union, from neighboring businesses and others. With respect to the people that are there, they are they are offered uh, uh, services. Uh, uh, they are offered opportunities to uh, be able to uh, uh, obtain uh, needed services, but it's not the fact that they're there that the problem is just the the uh, behaviors and the conditions that are that, that people face there with uh, some of the drug use and the associated uh, aggressive behaviors uh, and other uh, other impacts that have been problematic. And so, as a city, we try to just respond to those things. Uh, yeah. There, I have lots of questions. I'll just stop there. Thanks. Sure. Okay, Councilmember Golder. I'm prepared to make a motion, but if Council Member Brown has more questions or more concerns, I can let her go finish her thought. Thank you. I appreciate that, Council Member Golder. I think I'll just uh, leave it there for now, uh, just so we can move in the uh, meeting along. But I, I'll follow up, um, Martine, with you at some point soon. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion um, to ratify the executive order. 2020-20 through 2020-23 in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic emergency. So we have a motion by Council Member Golder, Council Member Matthews. I'll second the motion. I think the agenda reports and the resolutions provide ample documentation for the rationale. And just to clarify, it is to adopt the resolution which uh, which accomplishes right. all of the acts listed by Council Member Golden. Correct. Okay. So we have a motion by Council Member Golden, seconded by Council Member Matthews. Um, and I'd like to ask the clerk to call the roll call vote on item number nine on our consent agenda. 
Thank you. Councilmember Byers is um, currently absent. Uh, Matthews? Aye. Brown? No. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with Council Members Golder, Matthews, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, Mayor Cummings voting in favor, Council Member Brown voting opposed, and Council Member Byers absent. And I'd just like to say that I'm hoping at some point in the, in the near future we can get an update. Uh, and just want to let members of the public know that we heard um, you about wanting to have the update on what's happening with the street vendors. And so hopefully we can bring an item forward to an informational item that can um, bring people up to speed with what's happening there. Okay, uh, let's take a five minute break and, um, or actually I'll, I'll rephrase it. Let's just take a break and reconvene at 3.45. Member Golder, is there someone aside from Dino Pollock or Jorge Cruz that you would like to nominate? Yep. Okay. Vice Mayor Myers, is there any additional person who you'd like to nominate aside from no. Jorge Cruz or Dino Pollock? Okay. Okay, so it looks like before us uh, there's two nominations, Dino Pollock and Jorge Cruz. Um, why don't we go with Dino Pollock first, and then we'll see kind of where the votes or, or actually, uh, I'll go through each council member. There's two people who are being nominated, Dino Pollock, Jorge Cruz. When I call your name, say the name of the person you would like to nominate between, or that you would like to vote for between those two individuals. So we'll start with council member Matthews. Pollock. Okay. Council member Watkins. Pollock. Okay. Council member Golder, or sorry, Brown. Uh, Chris. Okay. Council Member Golder. Pollock. Vice Mayor Myers. Pollock. And Mayor Cummings, Pollock as well. So Dino Pollock will be our next um, Parks and Rec Commissioner, and his term will be through January 1st, 2022. Council Member Matthews. I wanted to, to state the obvious, as is often the case, there were several really well qualified candidates here and they brought very different attributes to the commission. And um, I believe when they're contacted, um, we encourage them to keep their applications active. And I know Tony Elliott has um, uh, some, some really inventive ways uh, to extend engagement of the community in um, supporting parks and rec in many, many ways. I think there's enormous opportunity for this. So I know that people love their parks, they want to support them. So I want to recognize all the applicants. Absolutely. And continue to encourage members of our public to um, volunteer and apply to commissions that you might be interested in serving on in the future because um, part of our democracy is having as much public engagement as we can. And so this is a great opportunity for members of our public to be engaged. And again, want to thank all the, the applicants who applied for this commission position. Uh, Council uh, Member Mayor, Matthews. Did I, I'm sorry, did I miss you? Did, did you open it up for public comment? Oh, my mistake. I don't think I did. So um, why don't we go ahead and do that? Um, Council Member Matthews, maybe if you can save your comment, I'll open it up. Or, or if it's quick, yeah. then we can just go ahead. It is quick. I just want to mention, in addition to applying for commissions, the city has a really robust volunteer program, and that is a great way to engage, um, aside from commission appointments, and it's a good uh, way to get that entry-level experience. So I just want to mention that in addition to the commission. Great. Um, are there any members of the public who'd like to speak to us on item number 29, which is Parks and Rec Commission appointment, um, one vacancy with the term expiration of January 1st? 2022. If so, um, now is the time to call in using the number on your screen. And once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes to speak. Okay. 
seeing no members of the public that would like to speak to us on this item. Um, I'll bring it back to council. It looks like we had a five to one vote for Dino Pollock to become our next commissioner. And with that, um, we will actually uh, we will adjourn for our afternoon session and we'll reconvene at 5.30 for oral communications. So um, we've had a pretty light meeting today so far and I hope everyone has a nice little break before our evening session. So we'll see you all back here at 5.30. Thank you. Thank you. oral communications. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely this evening, and I want to thank the public for staying home to view tonight's city council meeting. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you might miss your opportunity to speak. When it's time for public comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak during public comment, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will then be set to two minutes, unless you've called in to request additional time. And once you're done with your comments, you may hang up. And with that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers. Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Boulder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Present. And Mayor Cummings? Here. So again, um, this the item that's up on our agenda is oral communications. If you're a member of the public and you'd like to speak to the city council, an item that is not on our agenda, please call in using the instructions on your screen. Uh, once you've dialed in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you've been called upon, you will be given two minutes to speak to council. Oh, Bonnie, can you make me a co-host? Yeah, hi, this is Gary Phillip. Uh, in today's era of multiculturalism, e pluribus unum, which was an overarching unifying American culture of beliefs and principles, has been destroyed. To suggest that there are perhaps cultural determinants for things like economic inequality is usually labeled racist, sexist, homophobic, white male, capitalist pig talk by the far left. They assign those usually fear-filled, inflammatory, stale grievances as causation, which disingenuously mask their socialist, Marxist, revolutionary, anarchist ambitions and victim mentality, which prevent focusing at all on some very basic important cultural differences. Statistical significance says poverty tracks with high school dropout rates, births out of marriage before age 21, and not holding a full-time job. Black dropout rates are near 20 percent, as is their poverty rate. Indigenous people's dropout and poverty rates are above 25 percent. Similar readings can be said for other ethnic groups that has far less of both. It's a truism that 98 percent avoid poverty who finish high school, marry before having a child, and marry after the age of 21. But 79 percent who fail all three do live in poverty, according to the Brookings Institute. Add in proficiency in English, and the success rate goes higher. A typical child from a poor family already receives income and housing support, um, uh, health care, preschool education, college age, and employment training programs. Government can do only so much. What is missing is common sense values instilled by family into children that they are not victims. They must have goals. They must both compete and cooperate in society, cherish they live in a free capitalist country, and must acquire the skills and work hard to provide what other people need, want, and are willing to pay for. Leftists speak of white privilege. Since 80% of the population never receives a dime in inheritance, this is mostly myth in 2020. I know indigenous people have every right and benefit as an American citizen, but also enjoy 
enjoy extra billions of VIA aid, scholarships, exclusive rights to open so-called Indian casinos, other aid, and if that isn't privilege, what is privilege? People like Elizabeth Warren try to pass as indigenous because that privileged class pays for those who can work it. It is the same with affirmative action. I, I take it that's my time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next caller, the last four digits are 5362. Oh, good Hello. evening, Council. Um, everyone is using the word equity these days. Equitable access to Council is being denied, especially if one considers the significant digital divide <coughs> in Santa Cruz. Making major city decisions in the Zoom age is a poor excuse for participation in local government. The Board of Supervisors can allow public meetings. You should open the Civic Auditorium for Council. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is uh, Michelle. I am the program coordinator for the um, homeless, the California Homeless Union. I am absolutely not involved or affiliated with Alicia Kuehl, McHenry, or um, North. I would like to point out that um, Brunel spoke briefly about Food Not Bombs having a nonprofit status and felt that about um, revoking services to those in need. Upon further inspection, Food Not Bomb slash McHenry chapter and his cohorts have lost his nonprofit 501c3 status as of 5-15-2020. He is also not registered with the tax franchise board. He still is actively asking for donations, monetary, food, and Clothing. They are also saying they are helping fire relief victims. That is not true because that is Red Cross FEMA's. Um, sorry, I'm nervous. Um, that is their sole purpose to help the fire people. My belief is that he is fa falsifying documents. He has a long history of doing so. He has done this with one Katrina victim back in the day. He falsified. Um, papers to get into Katrina to give aid. He also has falsified his documents for um, his vouchers for the um, homeless. He also is, I believe he is falsifying documents to the city to say he has um, a nonprofit status in this city to continuously provide services that I believe are unsafe. Thank you for your time. Hey, good evening. Hey, good evening. Uh, hi, my name's Adam Novak, and I'm calling in about the library project. Uh, specifically, I'd like uh, to stress uh, the... I'm, I'm going to have to, to stop you since that's actually an item on our agenda. The next item is regarding the library. So if you'd like to speak on that item, um, you're going to need to call in during public comment. Uh, but if you'd like to speak to us on any other item that's not on our agenda, now's an opportunity to do so. All right, I can tell you my thoughts on Martine Bernal's executive orders, if you want to hear that. Uh, we actually, that was an item that was on our agenda today as well, so if you'd want to. All right, I'll just hold off. Okay, thank you. Sorry. The next speaker is Serge Cagno, who uh, called in, who asked for additional time 
from stepping up Santa Cruz. So, Serge, you'll have four minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes, good evening. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Serge Cagno, stepping up Santa Cruz. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for giving me a chance to speak. Uh, council members for... I'd like to talk about uh, things on which all of us agree. We'd all like Santa Cruz to thrive, for all to be healthy, for all to be housed, or at least safe, if not yet housed. Our collective values do not allow us to want the violence, assault, human trafficking, <laughs> loneliness, mental health trauma, and shame of being homeless to be on any of our community. That goes for the newly homeless from the fires. We want them to be safe from those uh, who were not able to earn enough during COVID, to those who are homeless and fleeing domestic violence, youth fleeing family violence, or those simply suffering from poverty. Our collective values do not allow us to want people to suffer. The question is whether any of those people deserve to suffer or choose to suffer, and I'll talk about that. All of us want a clean city where the trash is picked up. For some reason, the city is falling behind on that near where people are forced to camp. From the piles next to the trash cans, it can be seen that the homeless are doing their part, but they cannot take it to the dump. We're becoming known as anti-homeless, not by those who are homeless, which some would think will make homeless people just go away. We're starting to be known as anti-homeless by other jurisdictions around the country that are trying to help their homeless. There are pictures of our anti-homeless fencing that encapsulates our answer to those forced to live on the street. Make no mistake, the majority of those people are forced to live that way. I know many elderly people, many people with disabilities, many people that want housing. Shelter and housing is not available for everybody in Santa Cruz. So, some are on the streets. For those people, let's follow some of the recommendations that came from the catch that we didn't move forward on. Let's start a CAHOOTS-style program in collaboration with the county to be outreach first and let police do policing. Let's find a place for those when the, sh when the shelters are full. The bench lens is a success. Let's admit that low barrier can be safe and can entice some people who would not otherwise be in a shelter. Let's make more places for people to safely park at night rather than less. Let's make a strategic plan for our city's response to homelessness because what our city does is often counterproductive to what the county, the all-in plan and focus strategies are working toward. Let's stop blaming the county or other jurisdictions who actually have the extremely affordable housing ex affordable housing that those people need. Let's stop landlords from illegally discriminating from Section 8 vouchers. Let's make Santa Cruz thrive. And let's actually put health in all policies because somehow it hasn't been applying to the way that we deal with our homeless. Thanks. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. I hope you guys all have a nice night and you stay safe. Thank you very much. Again, so this is oral communications. It's an opportunity for people, uh, members of the community, to address the council on items that are not on the agenda. So if you've called in to comment during oral communications, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been called on, you will have two minutes to speak. Next caller, you're on the line. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. Thank you, Council, for taking the time out to hear me. My name is Brittany Potter. I am a local here from Santa Cruz County, um, and I am interested in getting the Loudon Nelson Center name changed. Um, Loudon Nelson, or as I like to call him by his actual name, London Nelson, was a, um, a free slave who came here in the 1800s left everything that he had to the Santa Cruz City Council District um, after all their schooling had shut down to continue um, the school of all the kids in the city. Um, after he died, they erroneously changed his name from London Nelson to what you see now on all uh, the buildings out front, which is Loudon Nelson. Um, I've started a petition on change.org as well as met with a few of the uh, center directors to go ahead and push to get that changed. I am not the first one um, to suggest that his name be changed. Um, 
what a remarkable man he was, and we can't even get his name spelled correctly. So once again, his name is not Loudon Nelson, but his name is London Nelson. Um, this is not something new. This is something that the city knows about, um, and yet we do nothing to change it. Um, the director of the center um, told me that maybe in June of 2021, which would be Juneteenth of 2021, we could possibly see if we could change the name. I'm hoping along with the council, as well as maybe your help, Mr. Cummings, that we can speed up that process. Um, nothing like being um, a, an, an awesome human and then they completely bought your name um, and your memory. Um, so if <clears throat> anyone who's listening on this line, anyone who, who would like to also stand with me, head over to change.org and sign that petition and also encourage the uh, council members to maybe, um, to maybe step up and, and put some fire um, under whoever's behind uh, needs to be so that we can go ahead um, and change the name of the center as well as all the letterheads, all the things that resemble um, uh, Loudon. Because uh, like I said, his name was London Nelson um, and there's, there's tons of history to prove so. Thank you very much. Okay, next caller, last four digits, one six six six. I believe you can press star six on your phone to unmute. Uh, hello. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, hello, Mayor Cummings, uh, City Council. My name is M. Hunt. I am the director of the California Homeless Union. I just want to state that we have no affiliation with Alicia Cool, Keith McHenry, or anyone associated with them or their organization. Furthermore, I am calling in regards to the city of Santa Cruz continuing to issue a permit to Food Not Bomb, who is no longer a nonprofit. They have had their status revoked as of May of this year. I think this is a gross malfeasance on part of our elected officials and the city to not only issue this permit without vetting the organization that it issued the permit to. I further believe this is conspiracy on part of the city to do so. Um, by your guys' actions and logic, I do not need a permit to operate within the city of Santa Cruz for anything, business, nonprofit, or otherwise. And that is very discerning because having a nonprofit status having insurance, being registered with the Franchise Tax Board, having a serve safe license, these are in the interest of the community. These are in the interest of public health. And I would ask that you change the process in which you vet organizations before issuing them a permit because it makes us as the taxpayer liable. All right, thank you for your time. Yep. Okay, this is going to be the final call. If you have called in uh, for oral communications, now is the time to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes. Good evening, my name is Kyle Davenport. I agree with the Loudon Nelson name change, that's awesome. Um, I am a fellow traveler on the life and process and journey of love and forgiveness. As if any of this resonates with you, please write it down and look into it. It's awesome. Okay, as you drive up Water Street towards uh, right past the town clock and you're going up the short hill towards the mission, there's a granite staircase on the left, and it is something I've never truly noticed or recognized. And I finally went and walked up those stairs. At the bottom it says public access, and at the top is something that brought me to tears and will always bring me to tears don't know what I'm talking about, please go look at it. Um, in 1945, World War II ended, and ever since, many people have said that world peace is their interest, and my interest is healing, so I'm here to talk about my healing. Um, and my healing is psychological integration, and that means awakening my inner loving, healthy parent and fostering it and supporting it so it can heal my inner child. All of my past wounds, all of my self-limiting beliefs, all of my subconscious beliefs that 
don't work and you utilizing my super conscious to do that and for me it is a very simple habit of affirmations guided he, uh, meditations and guided left hand or non-dominant handwriting this has been like an absolutely amazing discovery for me and i intend to do it for the rest of my life and i'm sharing it with you because I think psychological integration is our next key uh, for healing and not recycling the past, the past wounds, sexual assault, racism. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, again, if you'd like to comment on oral communications, and you've called in, please, and you haven't had a chance to speak, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Going on to the next caller. Last four digits are 0319. Um, it's your turn to speak, and I believe uh, you can press star six on your, there you go. Hi, this is Rochelle Maroyan, former council member, uh, just calling really dismayed about the vandalism that uh, Keith McHenry posted on his Facebook page, uh, Sharpies uh, to City Hall, as well as breaking a window where employees who have to work on site need to work. Uh, I'm not quite sure how much more he needs to do for the city and the county to actually start enforcing the law against him. Like previous callers have mentioned, he's serving food without a permit. He breaks county health codes constantly. And I would really like to see city council stop being in fear of actually prosecuting um, against him. Uh, I know that he threatens lawsuits, um, and I know that the city is afraid of them, but there's a certain point in time where you stop letting the city be held hostage by his antics. So I really hope that you show some leadership and that you really press our city attorney, city manager, um, county CAO to please uh, not allow this person to continue just um, exploiting poor people and exploiting ill people to um, push his crazy personal uh, agenda of uh, anarchist ideology. So please, I really expect some leadership from all of you to try to stop this because I'm not okay and I'm sure a lot of us aren't okay with City Hall getting vandalized and um, having employees put in danger through having windows broken. So thank you for listening to me and um, we'll be watching. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us during oral communications? If so, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes. Okay, seeing no further comments, I'll bring it back to council uh, for the next item on our agenda. Uh, but before I do so, I did want to acknowledge something that was said which was that earlier in the day there was a group of uh, community members who came to City Hall and were protesting outside and some of the members of the community came to protest, um, vandalize the building by writing on the building and also breaking one of the windows. And I just want to say that, um, you know, as a community, I think we all believe in freedom of speech and people's right to assemble and people's right to express their opinion. Um, but vandalizing buildings and uh, breaking city property is something that uh, should not happen. Um, it's not something that uh, we're condoning. And and I just want to say that, um, you know, while we encourage people to go out and speak, you know, speak their, have their freedom of speech and exercise their freedom of speech, um, vandalizing city property is, is not okay. And so I uh, just wanted to make sure that that was stated. And with that, I see a number of my colleagues' hands up, so we'll go over to Cynthia Matthews. Well, it's not only not okay, I believe arrests were made. In the um, a couple of things. Uh, I will need to excuse myself from the next item. As previously stated, I have a conflict of interest, so I'll be stopping, uh, stepping out on that. 
Uh, I also wanted to just comment briefly on the whole issue of Loudon Nelson, London Nelson. I think I've communicated with the mayor on this. Um, uh, Council Member Byers may remember back, but literally decades ago, I think it was about the time that the community center was founded, the issue of the name came up. The discrepancy in the name historically is well known to historians. Um, at that time, there was a movement to name the center London Nelson. Um, but there was a very strong reaction, in fact, in the local African-American community that felt strongly that it should be Loudon Nelson. I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> yeah. So um, before someone um, up this banner and runs with it, I think uh, at least the knowledge should be there that this is a, a very strongly felt opinion among the local African-American local African -American community at the time they preferred to stay with the London Nelson name. I just want to put that information out there for those that may not be aware of it. So with that comment, I will um, log off. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah. Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Council Member Matthews, for that context. And thank you, Mayor Cummings, for um, denouncing the vandalism that occurred uh, at City Hall. And I know a certain staff were really frightened, at, uh, rightfully, in terms of windows being broken right before them. So um, as Councilman Matthews mentioned, there were uh, several arrests uh, made in that incident. I was just seeing if maybe we want to have our city manager. There were um, you know, a number of callers who called to say that the, uh, the Food Not Bombs chapter of in Santa Cruz is not um, a legitimate nonprofit in terms of our partnership and, and permitting. I don't know if you want to speak to that or if you want to investigate that and return back to us just to explore what that uh, accusation was. I'll, I'll open it up to you, Martin. Uh, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to follow up with that. I think, uh, you know, with respect to the city issuing a permit, uh, it really is more in the context of providing guidance with respect to how to operate. Um, as I said before, the, our experience has been that they have had repeated non-compliance and that after a period of time we get uh, complaints and problems. Uh, and so again, the permit is issued in, in, in the spirit of uh, trying to provide guidance and, and operational requirements so that we can have some standards established for them. Um, however, uh, recognizing that uh, Mr. McHenry is not going to want a permit or request a permit or uh, stop his operations. Uh, and so it's just our way to, for us to better try to manage that and at least provide some guidance and some basis for trying to respond to the, the problems that unfortunately just happen to reoccur over and over again. So it's really more of a tool to be able to, able to do more, more enforcement and, and or achieve compliance. Um, and that's really is the intent behind it not necessarily uh, some kind of uh, acknowledgement that they're providing some kind of service or their status as a nonprofit. And that really isn't uh, uh, really the intent. It was in the context of the pandemic and trying to provide some, uh, some level of oversight and some distance to them. That's really the context. No further comments on this item. Let's um, go ahead and move on to the last item of business on our agenda, which is item number 30. Um, this is the award contract for mixed use library owners representative contract to Griffin Construction. So if there are members of the public who are streaming, um, if this is an item you'd like to comment on, uh, now it's the call, time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Before we um, hear the presentation, one thing I will point out is that um, we're going to limit public comment on this item, given that it came before us, um, I think it was at the first, the last meeting in September, and is now coming back to us after the public requested to see the actual contract before its approval. And a number of people have called to speak on behalf of groups. So I'd just like to say that if you're a member of a group, um, there throughout the community who is either in favor or opposed to this project, um, you may want to check to see if someone has been identified. Um, if someone has been identified from your group to speak, we're going to ask that that person be the speaker on behalf of the group and that we limit comments on this item 
And so the way that um, public comment will work is that I will call the name of an individual from each of the different groups, at which point you'll need to raise your hand and you'll be called on uh, and given three minutes, after which point we will then open up to the public for additional people to speak um, who are not members of these groups. So if you currently have your hand raised, I would ask that you lower your hand by pressing star nine on your phone and we will turn it over to um, Amanda Rotella and Ryan Borguna from um, Principal Management Analyst and Parking Program Manager for the presentation on this item. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor Council, Amanda Rotella, Principal Management Analyst in the Economic Development Department and the uh, Mixed Use Library Project Manager. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Hi, Deck. All right. Okay, so we're gonna just jump right in. Um, so we're here today to, to talk about the Library Mixed Use Project um, and today's focus. So just to sort of frame our discussion for today, um, on June 23rd of this year, um, council authorized staff to proceed with the selection of an owner's representative to manage the overall project um, implementation. And so the action that we're bringing before you today is awarding the contract for the mixed use library's owner's rep representative for phase one to Griffin Structures. So that is the recommended action. Um, in, at the, when we met in September on this item, council indicated that they needed some more background information and we're looking for some broad-based financial information in on the parking and housing components of the project. So we are bringing that with you today. I thought it would be helpful to just sort of frame up the project again um, and just provide context um, to both the council and the community. So current project concepts here, June 23rd, city council approved the downtown mixed use project um, concept that was developed by group four, um, option B as it was called, which includes a modern, <coughs> modern library housing out in the upper floors with a minimum of 50 affordable units and then parking in a structure with no more than 40, 400 parking spaces. How we got here. So some context here, 2017, the city council created the downtown library advisory committee, DLAC, to explore all of the project options. And they took six months to um, look at what we could do with the measure S funds and unanimously recommended moving forward with the mixed use project. The council took that recommendation um, on September 11th of 2018 and voted to move forward with the mixed use project. In 2019, council, um, put a pause on the project as we know and created the downtown library subcommittee which had our mayor, our vice mayor and council member Brown. And that subcommittee um, explored the options uh, particularly zeroing in on the mixed use and renovation options. And that subcommittee recommended moving forward with the mixed use project. And that was brought forward um, on June 23rd of this year where council again voted to move forward with that project. Um, some of the community engagement piece, because I know this is uh, an area of particular of importance. So the community engagement has been a big part of the entire process. You can see it was um, a substantial part of the DLAC process. We did an engagement um, process in 2018 leading up to the September 11th vote. And then as part of the downtown library subcommittee, um, our subcommittee members met with um, over 27 stakeholder groups and worked very dil diligently to have those office hours um, to be able to hear concerns from the community. And I will say that, you know, this project has been adapted as a result of community feedback. Um, you know, the project ha now has a smaller garage component. We've seen the addition of housing, um, the adjustment of the building so that only housing is above the, above the library, as I know there were concerns about um, it being below the parking garage. So there has been, you know, um, community engagement has been really crucial to getting us to where we are now with the pr project we have. Um, piece that I wanted to touch on, um, the downtown library subcommittee developed this criteria matrix um, where they kind of identified what are the key pieces that they were gonna use when evaluating a project. And really the three main areas were programmatic goals of the library, sustainability, and then really um, the, fiscal the fiscal responsibility and the most efficient use of resources and really felt that their recommendation to move forward with the mixed use project was a, as a result of I think over a hundred criteria that were developed in evaluating a project and really um, felt that the mixed use option best met these goals and um, really wanted to use the, our limited resources to be able to, uh, 
to obtain or um, to take advantage of, of, of as many opportunities as we could with this project, which included reinvesting in a new library, consolidating parking into garages so that we could have um, more opportunity sites for housing, and then maximizing the creation of housing. So it's some of the reasons that this project is really exciting is we're trying to do a lot with our limited resources. Um, today we're going to speak a little bit about the project funding. Um, both the part will go in more in depth in the parking and housing components. Uh, the library piece was not one of the pieces you asked us to come back with, but just to provide a sort of well-rounded picture, we're just going to touch briefly on the Measure S funding. And you did ask us to come back with broad-based financial information, and so I want to just sort of stress where we are in the process and our ability to provide um, the limitations on our ability to provide really specific numbers. And you're going to see a lot of ranges, a lot of estimates. Um, you know, we will be able to bring back some more detailed numbers once we have a, a final project design. It's hard to know, um, to price things out exactly until you have a design to add numbers to. Sort of like we saw, we have done some in-depth review and analysis of the library project, so we have some more firm numbers for that. That same level of assessment has not been applied to the parking and housing pieces and would, would be um, forthcoming once we brought on a design team. So um, I'm going to hand it off for our next piece, which is the library financing piece. And we have library director Susan Nemeth to be on the call. Hi, this is Susan. I'm hoping you can hear me. Yep. Um, Measure S is providing $27 million um, for the library project. Uh, I do want to point out, though, that when we brought Garfield and Branza 40 forward, uh, that was a million and a half above our estimates and the council did reallocate 1.5 million to the other branches knowing that that creates a hole in the library project um, the project's going to give us about 30,000 square feet but the real opportunity for us is to have an additional 5,000 square feet um, potentially for an additional three million dollars and we hope we can achieve that either through air rights fundraising um, and other private and governmental sources. I can go into a lot more detail. This is a really exciting project for us um, and would really like to keep moving forward. Um, and up next, I'd like to bring Bonnie Lipscomb, our Economic Development Director, who's gonna touch on the housing financing piece. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so, as Amanda mentioned, um, we have broad-based financial information on each of the components in the staff report. Um, we have had quite a few um, questions about the um, specific elements of affordable housing. So, I thought it would be good to actually show you a couple of recently completed projects that are city-led projects, just so that you can see um, the level of funding the types of funding sources that go into these projects. And then actually I am going to show a little more specificity of what we're proposing for the library affordable housing component of the library mixed use project. So the two projects um, on this screen, um, some of you may have seen before if you've been on our affordable housing tour. The first one is the city owned Tannery Artist Loft. Um, the campus is city owned. And this is a partnership with ArtSpace. Um, the total project costs 38 million. The cost per unit 381,000. Um, the city funding, um, and this is actually really low for an affordable housing project, but it's 62,000, a little over 62,000 per unit. But our total contribution, which at the time included a large part of the RDA, was 6.23 million total for that project. Um, the Riverwalk Apartments, a 21 unit project um, on Lemberg Street, um, that had a budget of um, total project cost of 9.3 million. Unit cost, you can see it's a little bit later, 445,000. There's also an economy of scale on the tannery project that made those, that unit a little bit lower cost. Um, 2.48 million of city funding in that project. Again, you're going to see city RDA, um, but you also have our HUD home program in there as well. Um, this is actually the proposal or the proposed breakdown. This is preliminary and I'm just gonna take a minute to go over this for the library affordable housing funding. We don't, you'll notice we don't have RDA funding in there anymore, but we do have some very reliable funding sources and I'll, I'll break those down in a few minutes. But typically what you're going to see with an affordable housing project is that we're gonna partner with an affordable housing developer and they're going to bring in the majority of the funding um, for the project. So 40% of that um, 
this is just a benchmark right now. It could be anywhere from 30 to 60 percent, probably closer. That's why I'm putting 40 percent of tax credit equity or an, basically an equity investor into the project um, will be um, a big part of the funding. Um, you're going to have a permanent loan based on future rent receipts to become a part of the project. Um, interest, general partner equity, um, all of the area on the bottom is really where I want you to focus because I think that's where we're having a lot of our questions. So all the areas that are in green um, are the various city funding sources that we're proposing to be part of this project. City land or fees, um, a permanent local housing allocation, um, which is being awarded to us. It's uh, guaranteed funding. Um, our allocation is $1.5 million, and I'll, I'll break that down in a minute. Our city HUD home program, CDBG funds, and funding from our city affordable housing trust. So those shaded areas that represent about 20% of the overall cost of the project, um, we're proposing at this time to be um, city funded from these funds. I will say that this amount could be less or more depending on um, how many units are in the project, depending on how successful our developer, our developer partner is in applying for other eligible state uh, and federal grants. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that in just a second. Next slide. Okay, I don't expect you to, uh, we won't spend long on this, but I do wanna say um, that this is available um, on the city website. We'll put it on the project site as well. And anyone can also email me if they'd like to follow up with any specific questions about this. But this is in sort of a uh, spreadsheet form, uh, three recently completed projects that I have the actual dollars for um, that are city, city led projects. So the tannery, our river walk that I just showed you, and then the most recent one is the 41 unit Lindbergh Street project. So on the top line, I have how many units, the cost per unit, uh, total project cost. Um, and then I have shaded in green again, just so you can see that as it relates to the pie chart, the amount of city funding um, and the percentage of the city funding as part of the overall funding cost. So when you see that column to the right with the percentage, that's percentage of the overall project cost. So what we're proposing again, um, specifically here in numbers, so you can see it is 1.5 million from the city's affordable housing trust fund, 500,000 from the city's HUD home program, and uh, 3 million city land and or city fees. Um, we often um, are dedicating or waiving um, deferring or waiving city fees to a project. And then uh, that permanent local housing uh, allocation that I mentioned earlier of 1 million. And if you go across, I'm not gonna go into the details of those, but you can see how that compares to the recently completed project. Next slide. And then just to break that down as the city contribution piece, so specifically uh, how much city funding in it compares to the, what we're proposing for the library project as it's compared to the tannery, the Riverwalk, and the Water Street, three recently completed projects. We're proposing six million. Um, that's approximately, as I mentioned, 20% of the overall project cost for affordable. What that equates to as the city contrib contribution per unit is about 120,000. So if you carry that line across, you can see how much we put in the tannery, Riverwalk, and Water Street, three heavily engaged and involved city projects. Um, this is a little higher, I will say typically, or not even typically, but more recently I'm seeing in other jurisdictions this number of the city contribution per unit be, can, can be as high as two, sometimes to even 300,000 per unit. It can be really high. Um, this is based on a benchmark of 600,000, um, the cost of 600,000 per unit on this, which is significantly more than you were seeing in the early days of the program. Okay. Um, specifically, just looking at those funding sources, again, I want to go a little a little deeper on that. There were some questions about that. Our city affordable housing trust fund, um, we're proposing to commit $1.5 million of that for this project. And what would it take to do that? If it is available right now, it would take a future council action. And if there's questions of why we haven't done that yet, is I think we're, we're waiting to pull together the full funding sources with our developer team. And once we know that, we come in as the city with a gap financing, with a proposed funding to really fill that gap. So that's why right now it's available, council action is needed. Um, the permanent local housing allocation, this is a, it's kind of like a CDBG. We um, are waiting to do this, uh, to receive the state agreement and um, we will be receiving 1.5 million. It is spread over five years. So we're proposing to basically commit three of the five-year allocation to this project. 
um, City HUD home program funds, CDBG, um, specifically I'm thinking HUD program funds. We currently have over 600,000 available now, um, proposing to commit 500,000 to this project. And then city land or fees. Um, this is uh, air rights. The valuation a value of that is going to be less than you're going to see for a couple of the other projects that is um, where we're dedicating the entire site and ground level site. Um, but that is a number that will be able to be used by the developer to leverage um, for state grants and to be more competitive for uh, low income housing tax credit. Uh, next slide. And then finally, I wanted to, I've had some questions um, also from council on, you know, what are our balances and what funding is actually available for future projects? So I just wanted to show a comparison because we have been working really diligently over the last year with our housing team um, and our, our selected developer, at least for the first Metro South, which is tax station <coughs> South, um, we are working with for the future housing. And we are in the process, and um, we're hoping we'll hear this week, it might be next week, on uh, we hear the announcements are coming um, for the um, Housing and Community Development Transit-Oriented Development Program. And we did apply um, with uh, For the Future Housing for $10 million for that project. So this chart basically shows, if you look at the top half of the chart, is the city funding source. If you look at the bottom half or bottom third of the chart, I want to emphasize this because we have opportunities in addition to the funding we already have internally at the city and our affordable housing trust fund, CDBG, home, and through our city land, those we control. But we have the opportunity to partner with an affordable housing developer and apply for these other state and federal grant programs. And the more city investment you have, the more you can leverage, the more competitive you are for these state funding sources. So. We feel really good based on the self-scoring and with recently posted, you can go to HCD's site and actually look up and get our uh, score of where we are now for this program. And we believe we're going to be funded. Um, stay tuned on that. Um, if we get that full 10 million, we may not need um, the city fees or the full home or CDBG that I'm proposing for Metro South. So this is an example of some of the fluidity of that, depending on what other state and federal sources are available. Metro North, um, the council previously committed uh, some of our former last remaining uh, redevelopment agency money, which we're now is now called the successor agency. So that's where that two million is secured for that project. Um, we also have the land um, as big components of those two projects. As part of the Metro South project, the parcels in that, even though we were successful in securing it uh, for $1.8 million, that combined with the other city parcels in that project has a total valuation of $8.5 million. And so, that, again, that's a city contribution to the project. Um, again, here you can see the library. Um, in comparison to those two projects, and we are estimating, you know, in the range of 107 to 120,000 per unit. But that could change. For example, if the library we go up um, and increase the number of units, some of this funding and some of the funding sources committed to the project, um, and the total amount of city subsidy could change as well. Okay, next next slide. And this is just a reminder, because um, I love this project. Um, I love all of our affordable housing projects. But this one is um, shows where we are right now with the um, with the project. Um, this shows a sort of a bird's eye view looking down at the uh, proposed Maple Alley improvements. This is a partnership with, as I mentioned, for the future housing, but also Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Dientic. And that's their second floor on this project. And then everything above that is the affordable housing. And then uh, next slide. And um, as requested, um, these are the developers who responded to our request for qualifications. Specifically of the nine that responded to a sort of a larger downtown uh, request for qualifications, seven of them followed up um, after the last council meeting we had in June, specifically with interest in developing the affordable housing component of the library mixed use project. And so you can see them here, and they're also included in this application. Thanks, Amanda. Great, thank you, Bonnie. Um, up next, um, we're gonna have Brian Borguno, who is our parking program manager, walk us through the parking financing piece. Good evening, Council. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of an overview of the parking financing component to this mixed-use project. 
Um, there's been a, a lot of work uh, that has gone into it previously, but because of some of the impacts and recent changes because of COVID-19 and some adjustments that we had to make, we, and, uh, we thought it would be beneficial uh, to revisit all the previous modeling and kind of provide an update uh, with more uh, new information inputs. Uh, next slide, Amanda. So some of that recap, uh, this slide just kind of shows that a lot of the legwork that went into discussing the parking financing piece started back in 2016. Um, and the main key, key, key takeaways from um, the work that happened was that there was a parking rate strategy developed uh, that went to the town town commission for approval and then back to council for approval and implementation. Uh, we began implementation of that parking rate strategy, which was a five-year plan of incremental rate increases in 2019. Um, and again, we had our, our second you know, step in that uh, at the beginning of 2020. So we are well underway in that five-year plan. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the estimates have changed quite a bit um, since we were originally planning with that parking rate strategy to cover the cost of a 600 space parking facility. Um, the supply has been capped uh, by previous council action at 400 parking spaces. Um, so we wanted to go back to um, our design consultants and kind of discuss based on the, the known uh, footprint that we're going to have and the, the reduction in parking spaces, what does the market rate look like um, in today's conditions for a parking facility. And so they came back to us with some estimates of uh, 50000 to 65000 per parking space, uh, which translates to $145 per square foot or $188 per square foot. So our total cost range as it stands today is somewhere between $20 million and $26 million, depending on you know, final design. Uh, we included three-year escalation of cost, uh, construction contingency, and also soft costs in some of these estimates. So this would allow us to complete the project for these, for these total amounts. Um, we won't know those final cost estimates until we get to that design phase. Uh, with the amount um, that we determined in, in this range, we would see a potential debt service estimate of $1.375 million or $2.1 million per year over a 30-year period, um, supported by the parking district, which we'll see in the upcoming slides. So you can go to the next slide, please. So in our modeling, we wanted to kind of, there's a lot of unknowns still with how recovery is going to go economically. So we wanted to kind of project out uh, a worst case projection, a mid-range projection, and a best case projection. Tonight, I'm only going to share uh, the worst case projection in the mid-range for planning purposes, uh, just to demonstrate in some of the, the assumptions that we made in those projections. Uh, so the, the anticipation um, in the next scenarios that you'll see graphically is that we've kind of projected out a five-year budget. Uh, using these inputs, uh, you know, COVID-19 impacting fiscal year 21, uh, the debt service payment being the highest amount of a $26 million project, uh, returning to some level of what previous actual fiscal year 19 revenues were um, by fiscal year 2022. We did not include uh, in this model of worst case scenario, we did not include any new revenue sources, um, for example, the parking in lieu fees. Uh, we did include uh, the sunset of deficiency fees still occurring in fiscal year 23 and potentially uh, having to take a look at uh, rate changes at that point. Um, fiscal year 23 is also the time where we would complete the five-year strategy that began in 2019. Um, in this worst case model, we did not anticipate all budget expense cuts um, and we also included expense escalation from uh, the last three years after we come out of recovery. Can you go to the next slide, please? So this is what the revenue and expenditures would look like. Uh, the first few years, 2016 through 2019, are actuals, and uh, fiscal year 20 is actuals as best we know it. Um, there might still be some changes to those final numbers uh, based on audits and, and such, but um, these numbers are the real numbers that, that we reported on the fund balance. Um, and then we projected out where we believe we would land in fiscal year 21 and beyond. So with this modeling, we show that we take a significant dip in revenues and we still didn't cut enough expenditures um, in fiscal year 21, um, but at, by fiscal year 22, you know, revenues exceed expenditures as they historically um, had in most years in, in previous actuals. Uh, the range in expenditures usually went up and down based on any given level of capital improvement projects that we were doing. And so you see some fluctuations in expenditures um, while you were seeing a consistent stream of increasing revenues until we uh, entered into the pandemic. Can you go to the next slide, please? So 
what does that mean for the parking fund balance? Um, it means that you know we're going to see a, a pretty huge hit in fiscal year 21, um, and but we're projecting being able to come out of it. Um, in the modeling, we included again the 2.1 million dollar debt service payment beginning in fiscal year 23, and still being able to build back uh, our parking fund balance. Next slide, please. That was worst case. Uh, what we're planning uh, as a more realistic option is, is kind of our mid-range projection. Um, you know, we, a lot of the assumptions are the same, but the biggest significant changes uh, that we made in, in the next graph um, is that we reduced the debt service payment to 1.865 million instead of at the higher end, we hit the middle range cost. And we included some additional uh, revenues that we, we believe will come to fruition. Uh, for example, uh, collecting on some parking in lieu fees for building permits that are currently in process and uh, that the actual facility would be completed sometime in fiscal year 24 and we would have new revenue from that parking garage. Uh, all the other assumptions were, were very similar and we did make some additional expenditure uh, cuts that we have already taken action to try to reduce our expenses for this year. Next slide, please. So that shows graphically uh, uh, the next, you know, mid-range projection, which shows a dip in fiscal year 21, but not as significant as a worst case scenario uh, with revenues and expenses uh, balancing out where we're back on the positive side by fiscal year 22 and including our, our debt service payment. Next slide, please. And this is a snapshot again of the same graph before, but with a parking fund balance that doesn't take as much of a dip in that we were seeing previously before. And in summary, I get the parking district fund supports the project. We, we don't anticipate needing any, any general fund revenues. In all the scenarios, we ran the projections best made in worst case scenarios. Uh, we, we anticipate that the parking district can support this project. Uh, one of the, the factors is the reduced capital cost with a 400 space garage. We were planning with the rate strategy uh, a significantly more expensive project. Uh, that and it saves us money uh, just by cutting the scope of work. Um, we've been talking with uh, some of the financial institutions that would help um, determine our eligibility for funding through direct lending. Um, and that right now it's looking pretty optimistic on competitive interest rates for both direct lending financing sources as well as uh, bonding opportunities. Positive impacts of COVID uh, tie right into that where we're seeing lower interest rates we're also seeing lower construction cost, and we may potentially have some capacity at our other facilities where previously we did not uh, during the construction period. Um, and a lot of the modeling, you know, we, we had built up funds and we're seeing the hit in fiscal year 21, in part because some of the actions we took uh, directly to relieve businesses during the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is waiving parking deficiency fees, permit fees, daily parking rates, and trying to do as much as we can to utilize that fund balance that we had built up. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, one of the other things that council had requested was some links to where people could go for more information. Um, we created the cityofsantacruz.com slash mixed use library project page um, a couple years ago, back in 2018, and I've given it a total makeover um, with uh, updates uh, with um, a whole project page that's set up that has project updates that I'm updating regularly. It provides background. It's a sort of one-stop shop for all the information about this project. And, um, and then an FAQ page and then some more details about the project. And specifically related to the FAQs, um, we included a, a number of FAQs in the, um, in the packet you received um, as well. You know, we really are trying to address all the sort of questions that are coming up, regularly asked questions, um, and want to make sure that we're clear and transparent on the details of this project. One of the things um, as staff that we do in preparation for the council meetings is review all of the um, emails that come in from the community, really wanting to make sure that we're taking in that feedback and hearing the concerns. And um, I noted a couple of points that came up quite regularly um, that had just some misinformation that I felt was important to address today. Um, really wanting to make sure that you as our elected officials and also the public have all of the details so that you can really assess um, and, and uh, take in this project and, and be able to ask further questions. So a couple of the ones that came up, um, what does this project look like? 
while the project has been approved by city council, it has not been designed. We have some preliminary designs that were uh, developed as part of the cost estimation process for the library portion, um, but the final design is really still to be developed and will include uh, community engagement and input as part of that process. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, once that design has been developed, this uh, we'll be able to provide further details on things like number of housing units, building height, and other details, um, and you know some specific numbers as opposed to ranges for the housing and parking components. One of the things that was referenced um, was that it's a six-story project. Um, we have not determined project height. That would be something that would uh, be determined as part of the design process and ultimately would be a city council um, decision uh, whether to approve any height beyond what the downtown plan allows. Um, lots of questions about the farmer's market. Um, I think it's important to note that the farmer's market will remain downtown. Um, we love the farmer's market. I think we can all agree that that is a part of what makes Santa Cruz and downtown Santa Cruz special is our Wednesday farmer's market. So we want to do everything we can to support the market. So they would be um, proposed to move just around the corner to excuse me, parking lot seven, which is at the uh, corner of Cathcart and Front Street, which would be a permanent location there. And while the lot is a different shape, it is actually um, comparable uh, in square footage. I actually did a little math <coughs> earlier today. Um, it's about a 900 square foot difference, which is about a 2% reduction in size. And we're looking at ways to expand that, um, the, the footprint that we've currently identified. Um, but really it's, uh, it's pretty equal in terms of size. Um, measure S funds, lots of questions about measure S funds and their ability to be used for new uh, construction. Um, you know, looking at the ballot language, it did specify uh, that new construction, building renovations, and service model upgrades could all be included. And other jurisdictions are actually in the process of building brand new libraries. Felton, Capitola, and Aptos are all using measure S funds um, for new construction. And really, you know, the city has, uh, through our different processes of looking at this project, really determined that it's, you know, moving forward with new construction is the best use of our taxpayer resources. Um, and then just a couple other questions that came up, um, questions about uh, the renovation plan. Um, do we get as much with the renovation plan? And really, um, sorry, where's my notes? Oh yeah, do we get as much with the renovation plan? And really, um, you know, as we determined as part of the downtown library council subcommittee, when we did those different cost assessments, um, we didn't, we we determined or the council determined that uh, the renovation option did not get us as much in the library. There was a reduced to collections system wide. Um, there was a failure to serve some of our teams and, uh, um, and provide other high demand services. Um, it doesn't provide, you know, uh, basic infrastructure needs like additional elevators, sufficient bathrooms, uh, perimeter controls, and, and really there was a limited long-term ability to expand or add green features in the renovation option. Um, a number of the letters uh, noted that the rent, uh, noted that the renovation plan was shovel ready. Um, I think it's important to note that the renovation plan is at a similar point in the process. Um, if we were you know, to move forward with that option, um, that it would require us to hire an owner's rep and put up, bring, it, bring a design team and get permits and develop a plan for a two year closure. So um, it, it's not as if this plan is just sitting there waiting to go. There would be further development and work and consultants that would need to be brought in as part of that. Um, lots of questions about the Nelson Nygaard study and where it can be viewed publicly. Um, the Nelson Nygaard study was presented to the Downtown Commission, um, which is the body that oversees things in the downtown. And uh, it's been available publicly since that time. And I also put it on our project website page in that background section. So um, the public can view that if you it there as well. And now, after all of that background information, uh, we can move on to where, uh, what we are here today for, which is the owner's rep contract. Um, just some quick little facts about uh, the owner's rep. Really, um, they serve as a project manager. They bring technical expertise and experience and will assist the city in managing the budget and timeline and will also oversee the design and construction processes. And owner's rep is a sort of um, typical approach that we take to some of our larger, more complicated projects. Uh, we used an owner's rep in the tannery, in the Marine Sanctuary Exploration Center, and have also hired owner's reps for the Brant, Forty, and Garfield Park uh, renovations. So this is uh, pretty typical. Our RFP process. So uh, we posted the RFP in July of this year. Um, after receiving council direction in June, uh, we received seven proposals, which was 
more than I was expecting. So I was um, incredibly excited to get so many interested parties, really strong proposals. Uh, we interviewed four teams. Um, there was a sort of multi-departmental review process. We had staff from economic development, planning, public works, and the library that reviewed the proposals and conducted the interviews. And all of the proposals were um, evaluated based on the project team, past related experience, their approach to scope, um, and then cost breakdown, uh, cost and fee breakdown. We were incredibly excited about Griffin Structures. Um, very happy that they applied. Uh, they were an incredibly, they had an incredibly strong proposal and really have um, a ton of experience working on complex projects, have experience working on libraries and affordable housing projects and parking projects. They have uh, 40 years of experience um, brought in as part of their team, uh, someone who works especially in community engagement and outreach. We were really impressed by their communication strategy for the project. Um, and they ha worked on both the Half Moon Bay Library as well as the Watsonville Civic Center. So they have worked in our area. Um, the project scope, I know there was a lot of interest in the project scope. So this is just sort of a basic outline, but included in your packet was, one, uh, was a draft contract, which included a lot more information, um, a lot more detail to each of these sections in, in there. Um, so you can see sort of an overview, developing a budget and timeline, which we would bring back to council, um, helping us with the affordable housing financing evaluation. You got a little taste of that from Bonnie. We would work with, um, with Griffin to, to finalize that and, and put together a plan. Um, they would help us bring on a design team and develop those construction documents, get us through the permitting process and all of that um, with community engagement and communications um, as part of their scope. We're recommending breaking this into two phases. Uh, we did, our RFP included, uh, our request for proposals looked at, was looking for an owner's rep for the entire project, which included construction. Um, we are recommending breaking the contract into two phases, sort of this pre-design, design and permitting phase as phase one, which would take us now through mid uh, 2022, and then going back to council for a contract for uh, managing the construction phases of, of the project, and we would be looking to do that and um, in mid 2022 before then, so we could have them under contract, obviously. Um, but yeah, so recommending sort of that phase one uh, piece, and that would just give us as a city a lot more flexibility around the timing and um, you know what we're committing to financially in terms of a contract rather than committing to the whole big package, having this smaller contract for um, for the $240,000. And the recommendation we're bringing before you, as stated in the staff report, is the motion to award the contract for the mixed use library owner's representative for phase one to Griffin Structures in the amount of 240,000 and authorize the city manager to execute an agreement in a form to be approved by the city attorney. And I just wanted to note, um, promise this is my last slide, uh, sort of where we are in the process and what the next steps would be. So um, we've received council direction on all of these pieces. So we would be looking tonight to finalize that contract with the owner's representative. We would work with them on that timeline and budget and return to council with that information. We would then work with the owner's rep to hire a design team. So the team that would help us figure out what this will look like and, and really uh, narrow in on those details that we know council and the community are eager to have. That'll be, um, those would be hammered out as part of the, de the design process, and we would return to council with those general schematics and, and the, that additional information. And then sort of on parallel tracks, um, I will also be working on exploring options for the existing library site. That was um, direction we received from council, and then also working with Farmers Market to finalize the design for their new location. So a lot of things will be sort of happening over the next couple of months, um, and so these are sort of all of our next steps. And with that, um, we, We'll take questions and I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you and thank you so much for that presentation because there's a lot of questions that I had that uh, were answered by the, the presentation you just gave and I think it provided a lot of, and from and, you know, the questions that I'm getting from people in the community, I think that it provided a lot of context for you know, understanding financing for the library and the garage component and then the library itself. I'm sorry, and, and if I miss affordable housing, but yeah, the affordable housing piece as well. That's great. Um, we'll this, be working to get all that information up on the website so we can really make it accessible for the public as well. Okay, great. So um, before we move on to the public, I want to see if there's any council members who have questions uh, for our staff. Okay. 
seeing none. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we, as we announced um, when the agenda packet went out, we're going to be limiting um, public comment. And so we encouraged groups to reach out to us. And so what I'd like to do is rather than having people just raise their hands, so if you've raised your hand, um, I'd please ask you to lower them. Um, and what we'll do is we'll start with um, the groups. So what I'd like to do is I'll call on the name of the group members. And at that time, um, if you would raise your hand, you will then, for the people who called in on behalf of a group, you will be given three minutes. And once we've gotten through the um, group representatives will open up for any remaining time to members of the public who are not part of groups. And so with that, I'd like to start with Sandra Ivani, uh, use measure as funds to renovate the downtown library. If you're on the call, please press star nine to raise your hand and you will be given three minutes to speak on behalf of your group. Hi there. Hi, Jason. Thank you for calling on me. So, wow, that was a lot of information. Um, and truthfully, uh, I disagree with you, Jason. It did not clarify things for me whatsoever. This project has become so complicated. I really would like to keep on talking about the library. We, um, we voted for uh, Measure S to restore the library, restore 10 libraries in Santa Cruz County. Some of that work has already begun. Um, some of that work has begun with the architect that has proposed the renovation in the downtown library. And I want to bring the conversation back to that because I think most of us grew up with a library that was a standalone library that was um, that they have a lot of memories of. And a library in a garage is just not really what I consider to be a library or what many people would consider to be a library. There's, there's so many comments I could make, and I, I'm worried about being cut off on time. So I'm going to go right to the, the, the point that's the most important for me, besides the one that I just made, which is let's talk about the library and not the garage, not the parking people, not the staff that is in the economic development that says this is going to be the housing miracle of the year, affordable housing, blah, blah, blah. There's so much to talk about here. But let's talk about the library as it exists now, the building that's there right now. What's going to happen with that building? That's what I want to know, because I drive past that building since this conversation has begun. And I'm fairly new in this conversation, because the fact is this is so complicated, been going on for so many years. Most people in the community can't even follow it, and I couldn't even follow it either. But now I've kind of looked into it. I'm still a novice. But looking at that building, it's fine. But, you know, I'm sure, you know, we people remodel buildings that are hundreds of years old, Victorians, thousands of years old. That, that building could be remodeled, and we could keep that building. So I'd like to know, in this plan, where you're coming up with a broad-based, quote, unquote, broad-based, and that was, wow, very broad-based, that, that information you gave, I, whew, I could not follow it, and I don't think any anybody could have followed what you were talking about there. But uh, what's going to happen with the building you have now? Is that going to be the, the building that we have now, that library? Um, uh, is that going to be remodeled for offices for Google? Is it going to be remodeled for um, uh, city staff? It's going to eventually be remodeled. Or are you going to just knock it down because it's not even worth uh, remodeling, which is, of course, absurd because uh, plenty of buildings that are in much worse shape that are much, much older than that can be remodeled. So um, I, I would want to have that in the plan and understand what you're going to do with it. I think this plan that you've presented with the library underneath the garage, with the so-called affordable housing that even, the even, okay, thank you very much. I, I hope you don't award the contract because it's a waste of money. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, um, I'd like to see if Mike Rock can, Democrats Women Club representative is on the line. If so, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given three minutes. OK, 
Okay, so again, I'm looking for Mike Rotkin from the Democrats Women's Club. And you can press star six to unmute yourself, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members. Uh, I'm Mike Rock, and I'm representing the Democratic Women's Club of Santa Cruz County, or DWC. We have over 270 members, most of whom are activists in the local community. I mean, they're all in the local community, Some of them, most of whom are activists. We support the uh, new library. Uh, all of the uh, comments that we got from staff make it very clear that you get a better library. This is aside from the question of housing or parking or anything else. You get more of a library, more space, more able to program more things in the new library. Despite the comments from the last speaker, the old library is not, it cannot really be rehabbed. We had problems with this library back when I was on the city council and mayor in the past. Uh, it has a ventilation system that cannot be upgraded. It needs to be totally torn out and that basically cut, cuts out the guts of the building. Um, generally, you would think everything could be rehabbed. Of course it can be rehabbed, but it costs more money and you end up with less of a library when you're done. Um, I'm not gonna go over all the reasons we support the library, except to say that we believe the new library gives us a better library. We want the best library possible for our community. And this is the heart of the library system. It's the main branch that supports all the other branches throughout the county. There have been a number of sort of specious objections to this project, for example, having to do with parking. Uh, as even the last speaker said, it's gonna be you know buried under uh, parking. No, they just told you a moment ago that it's gonna be on top of the parking. So people are not following the facts. Information goes out that there are gonna be 440 new spaces of for parking when we don't need that much new parking. In fact, you're gonna end up with a, 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 in terms of additional new parking when we're all done and all the existing city lots are built on for affordable housing, which is something many people support in this community. You're gonna have a, a around 40 or 43, I'm not sure the exact number, but a little bit more than 40 new additional spaces. And that, that's barely enough to cover the use of the library itself to say nothing of other kinds of businesses developing around it over the next couple of decades. So we support this project. It's been through uh, your, your library staff and the city staff support this project. Your committees that you've appointed from the library support this project. Your own council subcommittee supported this project. Two councils have voted to support this project. And whereas it's critical to get citizen input into the design of the project and other kinds of issues that are still before us, the idea of using these further uh, iterations of the development of the project as a way to go back and attack the basic project is not really legitimate. It's inappropriate. At some point, you have to take the fact that you've made a decision and move on and take comments on design, take comments on the nature of the, you know, the contract with the people that are gonna do the oversight of the construction and so forth. Those are appropriate things to bring before the public but people should not be using that to bring up the overall question of whether we should build a new library. I think that decision's been made by your council, and at this point, you ought to invite public input into the next steps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next um, speaker is Casey Byers from the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce. So Casey, if you're on the line, if you could please, please press star nine and you will be given three minutes to speak on behalf of your group. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cummings and City Council. This is Casey Beyer. Uh, I am the CEO of the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce. We represent over 600 member companies throughout Santa Cruz County and a large percentage of them work in the downtown area. Um, we support this project unanimously. It brings together um, uh, affordable housing, a 21st century library built by this generation for the next generation. Think about that comment for a second. Building something for the next generation, the children and the kids that'll be our leaders in the next generation. This is for them. It also creates adequate parking to accommodate uh, current employers and employees that work in the downtown. And it also helps for customers and the visitors that come to the downtown. 
bear in mind, we have a wonderful Kaiser Arena that is the whole home to the Santa Cruz Warriors, and they are a legacy in this community. Think about where those visitors and those uh, season ticket holders and the people that from the community go to enjoy the Santa Cruz Warriors. Where are they going to park? This is a great opportunity to put it closer to the arena and, and a vital uh, community connection. So on behalf of the Santa Cruz County Chamber of the Commerce and our, chamber, uh, and our members, I urge you to support this contract and do it now. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our list, we have Robert Singleton, Santa Cruz County Business Council. Robert, if you're on the line, if you could please press, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, you will be given three minutes to speak on behalf of your group. Okay, so again, looking for Robert Singleton from the Santa Cruz County Business Council. If you are on the line, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given three minutes. Okay, I'm not seeing Mr. Singleton at this time, so I'm gonna move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, Yolanda Henry, Downtown Library Advisory Committee. So Yolanda Henry, if you are on the line, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given three minutes to speak on behalf of your group. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. This is Yolanda Henry and tonight I'm representing the Downtown Library Advisory Committee and uh, that was formed in 2017. Um, you know, this advisory committee was composed of members from different sectors in our community, and they represented the downtown businesses. We had parents who represented homeschooling, the arts, uh, community members at large, and um, we also had two retired librarians on this committee, one from the Library of Congress and another one from the City of Los Angeles. So we had a lot of expertise in our group. I myself represented the nonprofit sector and underrepresented groups. We conducted 1,200 surveys of community members. We also conducted two focus groups, one of which was in Spanish, and uh, we held one community meeting. So in addition that we met and toured uh, libraries as well. And uh, one of our libraries that I was very impressed with is our Watsonville Library that uh, has a beautiful library in conjunction with the courthouse and um, also the city hall and a parking structure. So that right there in our county shows you that um, buildings can be utilized to the maximum and leverage our funding that we have through Measure S. And so we would like to urge you, strongly urge you to approve the owner's representative contract. Our city deserves a new modern library for the 21st century and 50 affordable housing units, as well as the parking that we need. And you know, our city depends on tourism. And as much as I would like our own community members to get to do more walking, to use public transportation, and to get on bicycles, many of us are not going to do that. But our, our tourists who come, uh, they're going to drive here and they will need places to park and uh, so that they can shop and dine in our area. And our library, uh, I think Mike Watkins summed it up well about that the structure is, that would not be money well spent there. Our city deserves a beautiful new library that will that serves the 21st century and will be around for you know generations to come. So thank you very much. 
Thank you for your call. Okay, so next on the list we have Rena Dubin, Library Advisory Commission. Yep. Hi. Hi, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, City Council, for your time. My name is Rena Dubin, and I am one of the commissioners representing the City of Santa Cruz on the Library Advisory Commission. I urge you tonight to approve the contract with Griffin Structures as the owner's representative for the Downtown Library Mixed Use Project. The Downtown Library functions as a crucial branch to the entire library system. This library needs to be large enough to support our general collection, along with veteran services, genealogy collections, teen services, and historical and archival storage, all of which could be cut or eliminated if the mixed-use project does not move forward. The community has shown support for the best library possible, a library that meets the needs of today's users. We must keep this project moving forward in order to bring Santa Cruz the modern 21st century library that our city deserves. Please approve the contract with Griffin Structures so we can move on to the next steps. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, next on my list, I have Zach Davis, Downtown Management Corp. So Zach, if you're on the line. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, good evening. Wonderful. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak on this issue. Um, I'm Zachary Davis, here as the past chair of the Downtown Management Corporation Board of Directors. And as you all know, the DMC is the organization that oversees the Cooperative Retail Management District in the downtown and directs the use of funds collected through an assessment on each parcel in the district. Um, the Board of Directors represents a broad collection of stakeholders as it includes both downtown property owners and downtown business representatives. Reviewing our minutes, our meeting minutes, I, I believe the DMC first discussed and considered the mixed use library project in the fall of 2016 and has followed the project ever since, including the robust work of the DLAC and the City Council Library Subcommittee. Uh, a little over the year ago, I had the pleasure of speaking with the subcommittee on behalf of the DMC and spoke with um, several of you. Uh, at every point, it has been the consensus of the DMC that the mixed-use library project is in the best interest of our downtown. Consolidation of parking and the potential to offset parking requirements for future workforce housing, more folks living in the downtown in affordable units, and perhaps most important, rather than pouring money into a structure that will result in a smaller library and reduced services, building a 21st century library that will be a jewel of our downtown. All of these are benefits in the eyes of the DMC. I urge you to approve the owner's representative contract for the Downtown Mixed Use Library Project, and I thank you for your time. Good night. Thank you. Okay, next on our list we have Jane Barr from Eden Housing. So Jane, if you're on the line, if you can press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Thank you. This is Jane Barr. I'm Associate Director of Real Estate Development for Eden Housing. Eden is one of the nine developers that responded to the city's RFQ last year. We are very interested and supportive of this project. I ask that you approve the contract for the mixed-use libraries library owners representative tonight. This project has been under consideration since the library bond was approved in 2016, and the council first approved relocating the, down library into, uh, the downtown library into a mixed-use project in September of 2018. A council subcommittee was established in 2019 to explore all the options. Its work ended in the subcommittee's unanimous support of the mixed-use project and sub subsequent council's approval in June to move forward with the project. The project will result in a modern, expanded, and efficient library to serve the 21st century needs of the community, including internet for students who may not have internet in their homes, separate spaces for children and teens, and community meeting rooms. In addition, the city has been far-sighted 
and including a parking garage and affordable housing. The form will be, former will be necessary to replace parking lots lost due to future development necess necessitated by growth. Adequate parking will entice shoppers and tourists to support downtown businesses. The affordable housing will address a need that has been obvious and growing for years. It will provide housing for Santa Cruz City residents that is affordable and will take the burden off of them in deciding between paying for rent, food, or health costs. Residents will provide services to support them uh, to improve their lives. The housing could also provide a reliable local source of workers for the downtown businesses. Downtown apartments will allow residents to walk to work and shop where they there, which will further support downtown merchants. This in turn will increase tax revenue for the city. Now is the time to act on an extremely long process in which you have bent over backwards to reach out to the community. The project before you is well planned and much needed. To not approve this contract tonight would be death by delay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next on my list, I have Matt Farrell, Downtown Commission. Matt, if you're on the line, if you could please press star nine. You'll be given three minutes to speak. Uh, good evening. Thank you, uh, Mayor Cummings and council members for the opportunity to speak. I'm currently the chair of the Downtown Commission, having served on the commission since January of 2015. Chair Hamilton was not able to attend tonight's meeting, so I am taking her place. I urge you to support staff's recommendation and approve the owner's representative contract for the library mixed-use project. The Downtown Commission has consistently supported this project. In June 2018, the Commission approved recommending to Council the parking rates and fee schedule to provide resources for financing the parking portion of the mixed-use project. Hiring an owner's representative is the right decision for the project. As mentioned earlier, Griffin Structures has strong local experience in our area, having worked on the Watsonville Civic Center project, the Salinas and Half Moon Bay libraries, experience which will transfer directly to the work we have before us. The city of Santa Cruz has used outside expertise in developing the Tannery Art Center, a city mixed use project that was included city land, housing, artist studios, galleries, and the Arts Council offices. The questions raised by council members at the September 22nd meeting have been addressed. I want to close by stating again that the commission has consistently supported this project and urge you to approve the owner's representative contract. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on my list, I have Mark McCedy Miller, Downtown Forward. So Mark, if you're on the line, you can please press star nine on your phone. Hi, thank you. My name is Mark Masidi Miller, and I'm here tonight representing Downtown Forward, a grassroots community organization focused on initiatives and projects that will make life in downtown Santa Cruz better for residents, workers, and visitors. Tonight, we urge you to award the owner's representative contract to Griffin Structures, a well-qualified firm with a wealth of experience in both libraries and mixed-use projects. Retaining Griffin Structures will provide the expertise needed to deliver the best possible project at the least possible cost. Downtown Forward supports this particular project for many reasons. First and foremost, equitable housing. Realtors are fond of saying location, location, location. When it comes to downtowns, urban planners are fond of saying housing, housing, housing. Housing in downtowns is the key to avoiding the bustling city by day, dead city by night problem. Nothing creates a safe and thriving downtown better than abundant housing that guarantees a constant hum of human activity. The beauty of this project is it will create 50 units of permanently affordable housing for families with below average income. Second, 
efficient transportation. Replacing almost 400 surface parking spaces in a new multi-story shared parking facility will reduce the need to provide dedicated parking for other individual projects. This shared parking will make it far less expensive to develop affordable housing such as planned at Pacific Station, community healthcare facilities like the Community Health Center and other community serving projects like the library. With its location so near the Metro Transit Center, this shared parking will also provide a central location for bike sharing, bike storage, car sharing, and other mobility options. Third, an attractive central library. The proposed all new library will provide an accessible single level layout with more space for teens and young children, including a separate entrance to welcome children and their families. This is exactly the library we need to serve us now and for future generations. Fourth, the environment. Creating more housing in our downtown and near the largest transit hub in the county will reduce vehicle miles traveled, the single most effective way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fight climate change. Transforming an existing surface parking lot into a mixed use development is a most sustainable use of scarce land in our downtown. You have already heard and will be hearing from others in our community, including affordable housing representatives, community health practitioners, library advocates, environmental advocates, and transportation advocates. Support for this project is broad and deep. Please, for the sake of the people, the planet, and prosperity, move downtown forward tonight and approve the Griffin Structures contract. Thank you. Thank you very much for your call. Uh, next on my list, I have either Micah Posner or Robert Morgan from the Sierra Club. So I think if you hit star six on your phone, you'll unmute yourself. Again, if you hit star six on your phone, I believe that will unmute your, your phone. Thank you very much. Sorry about the glitches there. Good evening, uh, council members. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Yes, this is good evening, Mayor. This is Bob Morgan. I'm speaking on behalf of the Sierra Club. Um, our membership is over 3,000 strong residents in, in the county, and most of the city of Santa Cruz. They overwhelmingly want to renovate the current library across from the city hall and create a civic center bordered by the civic auditorium, city hall, and the current library, a civic space that intersects government, education, and culture. We represent our constituency and respect their views. That those views align with Sierra Club policy strengthens our resolve to oppose this current project. We ask that you abandon it. We understand the need for affordable housing downtown, but we advocate for housing on Lot 7 on Front Street or another city-owned lot. We're puzzled why housing is a necessary component in the project, especially since the parking structure is not needed. The city's own parking census data shows a 10% decrease in parking use from 2008 to 2018 prior to the pandemic. We're certain a new parking structure is not needed downtown, even with building on future lots. Our members care about the environment. This project harms our local environment. Instead of renovation, its construction is resource intensive. It prioritizes single occupancy vehicles over transit, parking reform, and transportation demand management. Those things that your own consultants have said must come first before we build another costly concrete garage. Even more significant, this project robs us of the opportunity to recreate parking lot four into a green public commons, a central home to our iconic farmer's market shaded by heritage magnolias and liquid amber trees. 
and we can expand our vision of outdoor art and music events one block away from Pacific Avenue. What a boon to business. A green common supports the city's health and all policies initiative brought to the city so persuasively by former Mayor Watkins. Those municipalities who have adopted health and all policies to shape their cities would love the opportunity to create a green public space in the middle of this in the middle of a downtown. The Sierra Club asks you to renovate the current library, manage congestion and transit, not build parking garages, build housing on Lot 7, and create a stunning green oasis downtown. Please stop this unpopular project. Thank you very much. We appreciate your work, and we do not recommend or urge you to sign this contract. We would like you to stop this project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on my list, I have Martin Gomez and Vivian Rogers, friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. If you're on the line, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given up to three minutes. So it looks like there's two people, so maybe if you could split your time efficiently, I think that might be a good Hello. Way to go. Good evening. Yes, please. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, my name is Martin Gomez, and I'm the interim director for the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Our mission is to support the library through fundraising, volunteer services, and advocacy. The Friends have played a leadership role in the passage of various library initiatives, starting with Measure B in 1998, Measure R in 2008, and Measure S, the library bond measure that will provide nearly $67 million to support the construction and repair of library facilities throughout the county. On behalf of the Friends, I'm urging you to approve the contract with Griffin Structures as the city's owner representative for the downtown library mixed use project. Here are some reasons why we believe it is important to approve this project. Through our voter approval of Measure S, the community has shown its support for a robust library system that meets contemporary and future needs. And the current downtown library as the main library for the entire library system is inadequate and is structurally and programmatically uh, unsound and no longer capable of fulfilling its role as the main library. I also served as a member of the Downtown Library Advisory Committee and along with other members of the committee, we unanimous, unanimously recommended the mixed use project because it meets the program need, programmatic needs of the library system and achieves a cost effective combination of community benefits, including a new library, permanently affordable housing, and a program of shared replacement parking to support downtown visitors. Funding for this project will be assembled through a multiple sources, including a commitment from the Friends to raise private funding for the project. The Friends and its affiliated chapters have recently successfully raised over $500,000 for the Felton Library, over $600,000 for the Capitola Library, over $100,000 for the library in La Selva Beach. And we are well on our way to completing a challenge grant from the Monterey Peninsula foundation that will yield another $600,000. I have no doubt that we can do this, help to raise money for the downtown library. We're committed to doing that. We are currently working with fundraising council to research prospects for raising additional donations for the downtown Garfield Park and Grant Authority libraries and fully expect to launch successful campaigns for these projects. The Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries fully appreciate the commitment from the City Council, and we think that it's now time to move forward on a great project, and we urge the Council to approve the contract with Griffin Structures. I believe uh, Vivian may be on the line, sir. Vivian, it looks like you can move up. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, next on our list is Tim Willoughby from Affordable Housing Now. So Tim, if you're on the line, if you could please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You'll be given three minutes to speak on behalf of your group. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mayor Cummings. Uh, Tim Willoughby with Affordable Housing Now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Oh, thank you. Uh, there is a community consensus that affordable housing uh, is a priority. And the greatest need is for very low and low income units. It takes significant city subsidy to produce those units. The most important being using city owned land. There are four large downtown city owned lots with potential for significant numbers of housing units. One is the library mixed use project and another is the existing library site. Taking those two out of the equation would essentially cut the potential for affordable housing units in half. Please vote to move this forward. The thousands of people on the wait list for affordable housing will thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next uh, on our list, we have Judy Gunstra speaking on behalf of herself and then Bonnie Belcher. So Judy, if you're on the line, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given three minutes. Okay, so again, looking for Judy Gunstra. Okay, I'm not seeing Judy at the moment, so I'm, I'll keep moving on. Uh, next, we have Jean Brocklebank, Don't Bury the Library. So if Jean Brocklebank is on the line, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been called on, you'll be given three minutes to speak on behalf of your group. So again, looking for Jean Brocklebank, Don't Bury the Library. If you're on the lot, <clears throat> please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Good evening. Is this Jean? Yes, it is. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Don't Bury the Library has always been about all about the library. It is simply not true that the Jason rebuilding proposal cannot provide services and programs just as well as Group 4's proposal, or that Jason's would be a smaller library, or that it does not provide for teens and children. That's baloney. Plus, the Jason proposal provides for parking right next to the library entrance, and the current structure withstood the 1989 earthquake. Group 4's $27 million proposal, which you approved in concept, was for a small 29,660-foot, square-foot, bare-bones library. Since council gave a million and a half of that $27 million to two other city branches, Group 4's cost estimate is underwater. It will really require another six to seven million to build the so-called bigger, better library presented to you. An owner's representative does not procure funding, so we still see both the library and the housing component short of funding. Most importantly, yesterday, the city released news of a special six-hour meeting of the city council on Thursday. That's two short days away. The workshop objective is to, quote, establish priority areas of focus for the city council and staff for the next 12 to 18 months. The six-hour workshop is where council re will review 26 separate significant projects underway. This makes sense to us. One of those 26 projects is the one before you tonight. So wait a minute, tonight is backwards. Does approval of a contract tonight before council has looked at the mixed use project in relation to 25 other separate significant projects make any sense to anyone? 
Tonight, we ask you to resolve to wait until after Thursday's workshop before moving any further on anything to do with the mixed-use project, thus demonstrating to the public that the Thursday workshop is not perfunctory in nature. And, got to say it, Council Members, on November 10th, we ask you to resolve to direct staff to implement the Jason Architecture proposal or, given the financial circumstances, have Jason propose a prioritized renovation of the most integral components of the existing library so we can have an upgraded, modernized library designed for post-COVID library services before we lose any more of Measure S funds. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to go back through. There's a couple people who I want to just check to see if they're on our call now, and they, maybe because they missed their spots earlier, but Robert Singleton from the Santa Cruz County Business Council, if you're on the line. Hello? Is this Robert Singleton? I don't think this is the right caller. Okay, so if Robert Singleton from the Santa Cruz County Business Council is on the line, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been called on, you'll be given three minutes to speak on behalf of your group. Hello? Good evening. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, my name is Robert Singleton. I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council, and I would just like to urge you to vote to move forward with this project, to hire an owner's representative to represent the best interests of the city as this development project moves forward. I don't need to take a lot of time to reiterate all the positive reasons why you should support this project. Obviously, it would build uh, at least 50 new restricted units of affordable housing in the downtown area, close to transit, exactly where you want to build these types of units. Obviously, it would get us a brand new uh, state-of-the-art modern library that would help provide services not only for our local students, but for those of lower incomes who don't have oftentimes the access to internet and other amenities that are necessary. Um, it would also provide us with a little bit of parking to help offset the development priorities for the downtown, which include building a lot more affordable housing on our surface lots and making sure that we're maximizing the available use of land in our downtown area. Um, this falls in line to all the categories from our not only our climate action plan, from our general plan, but from the new downtown plan that we've adopted. All of these priorities are core and are our linchpin to help facilitate the new vision of all of downtown Santa Cruz. One that involves a lot more housing being developed, a brand new transit center, a lot more affordable housing being built, a brand new state-of-the-art library, a permanent warriors arena. This is a linchpin project that helps us realize all of these long-term goals, and we can get it done for a lot less money than what we would otherwise spend on investing in each of these projects individually. So please move forward with this largely administrative and routine task of appointing an owner's representative to advocate on your behalf. Griffin Structures has a ton of experience building mixed-use facilities in other cities, including that of downtown Watsonville, where their mixed-use library, parking, and civic center project is an extremely popular and well-utilized project. So again, please move forward with this. You've heard tons of testimony across four different years since we've passed Measure S. Now is the time to get it done. I urge you to move forward. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back to see if Judy Gunstra, speaking on behalf of herself, and Bonnie Belcher, who couldn't make the meeting, if she's on the line. If so, please press star nine on your phone and raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing Judy on the line, so uh, we're going to move on to comments from the public. As I mentioned before, we've had a lot of um, comments from members of the public, and so um, we're going to 
try to keep things uh, relatively short tonight since the last time this came before the council, uh, we had extensive public comment. And so we're gonna limit the remaining comments to one minute. So if you are a member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item and you haven't spoken already on behalf of a group, now is the time to call in using the number that's on your screen. Once you've entered the meeting, you wanna press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been uh, asked to speak, you'll be given one minute to speak on this item. Hey, all. I'm Kyle Kelly. I'm calling in support of the library mixed use project. Uh, originally, I was conflicted on this project due to the introduction of additional parking. Uh, I was happy that some of the parking was reduced. Um, and. And I wouldn't want to make that in any any bit of uh, nimbyism towards the project. After learning about how the project is financed uh, and the fact that because the parking shares walls with library and the housing, it ends up making it so that we can afford more library and afford more affordable housing. Um, I've heard people comment before that you know affordable housing projects can be put on other city-owned property, but that always comes up on every single project that it could just go somewhere else. Like this is a great chance for us to put in social housing that's going to meet low incomes, very low income, um, all the way all the way through moderate incomes. And the only thing restricting us from building even more housing is a height limit that the city council put in in the past. If if we want to see more housing, get it done. The only other thing that I I'd like to see. Oh, that's my time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mayor Cummings, this is Deb Tracy Prue, um, and I'm speaking tonight in favor of approving the contract with Griffin Structures. Um, as a parent and a school board trustee and a former librarian, my interest in this project is to bring a true 21st century library and gathering space to our community that will serve our youth now and on into the future. Um, the mixed use library space is a great project and it's a genuine investment in both the library system and in our downtown. And I really urge council to be forward thinking and invest in our future by approving this contract. Thanks for your service. Thank you. Hey, um, this is Reggie calling again. I called in earlier. Um, you know, it's not often that I agree with um, other people on this call like uh, Kyle. Um, but you know, this project and its financing details uh, did look pretty decent to me. The one thing that I really would like though, if anyone on council could do this, this would be great. I just don't like the hand waving uh, about affordability. I like guarantees. And so I hear people outside council, outside staff, I didn't see this anywhere in the report, talk about deed restriction. Now deed restriction is a very important guarantee of affordability. And if someone wants to motion a friendly amendment when they pass this to say, can we guarantee to the public today that these will be deed restricted units of affordable housing, not section eight voucher, not uh, condos that are like micro units that are supported by design, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. This is Tony Campbell speaking. When I was chair of the, of the Library Joint Powers Board a couple of decades ago, we recognized that the downtown library building was outdated and inefficient. The best we could do then was to abate asbestos in most of the building. You can do so much better than that now by combining Measure S funds with financing for parking, for low-income housing, and from other sources to make a smart civic investment. Do that and we'll all end up with a truly modern building, not a warmed over, make-do building. I encourage you to award the owner's rep contract and to move forward with the mixed-use project. Thank you. Thank you. First thing 
I uh, would like to request the three minutes. I emailed twice to uh, Bonnie Bush and to you, Justin Mayor, uh, Justin, uh, to represent Downtown Commons advocates. Uh, I'd like to reserve the time to get that settled first. I actually checked my email and I did not receive an email. I double checked with the clerk earlier today and we did I not receive the email. So I apologize for that, but yeah, we didn't. Uh, receive well, that's uh, I think an email problem because Amanda Rotella also said she did not find an email from me and it was buried uh, from two weeks ago. At any rate, um, I am convener of Downtown Commons Advocates um, in favor of creating a Downtown Commons. I want to look today at um, the project viability in terms of risk analysis, is, which is what insurance companies do. And for the mixed use project, the overall risk of not succeeding is the sum of various independent risks. I address, and if I had more time, we'd do it in detail, uh, the ways in which the risk is underestimated uh, for housing, uh, for parking, and for uh, funding of the library. We already know that the funding of the library is uh, 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 three to six million dollars short. I conservatively estimate uh, that uh, the funding uh, risks from the three project components are equal to about 35%. That is to say, if you move ahead with this project, you have a one in three chance that you will not have the funding for it. Also, you have a 75% chance, I would say, of not meeting it within the timeline. Please abandon and reject this folly in the time of a pandemic and economic crisis. I don't feel like I've been afforded the time I deserve, but thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Hi, um, good evening, Mayor Cummings and council members. My name is Coco Rayner Walter and I'm the chair of the Santa Cruz County Democratic Central Committee. And we wholeheartedly support this project. We voted on it and the committee is urging you to approve the use, the owner's representative contract. Um, I was the campaign coordinator for Measure S this meets all of the goals that we set in motion um, for the bond, and we're very excited about this and think it's a great thing for our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Thank you, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Um, we are in the midst of a crisis affecting us in many ways, not least financial. But in the report prepared for this agenda item, I found exactly one mention of the pandemic. Uh, in tonight, the only real recognition of the effects of the pandemic that I've heard were in the parking presentation. We need to acknowledge the reality of our financial crisis and reject this motion. It makes no sense to award nearly a quarter of a million dollars in these circumstances. Also, funds for this contract include Measure S funds, which already were inadequate and have been further diminished. Most of us in these times have had to make changes and reversals in our plans this year, and some of those have been pretty drastic and unimagined changes. The city needs to seriously reconsider and question the feasibility of this plan. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, my name is Christian Sandell and I'm calling to oppose this project. I do not think it's in the best use of 
I, I, don't, I don't think it's in the best interest of city or county funds, especially in the face of such sustained community opposition, and particularly in light of the recent economic downturn that we are facing, the pandemic, the recovery from the fires. We have a lot of problems in this county, and I don't believe that we should be moving ahead with this project. I support affordable housing, but there are other city-owned sites that could hold far more than 50 units, such as Lot 7, which is not well suited as a new home for the farmer's market. I voted for Measure S, like a lot of other people, in the belief that the library would be renovated or rebuilt in place. And this feels like a misuse of that vote, which was given to you in good faith. Please respect the voices that you're hearing from the community and our objections, and do not move forward with this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, this is Elizabeth Conlon. I'd like to join others in support of moving ahead. Um, this project clearly gives us the best library possible, homes for 50 families, a nice new designated spot for the farmer's market. And, you know, I really trust the city professionals that, uh, that they've done the due diligence on parking needs and balancing the needs of local businesses, visitors, employees, and future residents of downtown, while also trying to promote transit alternatives. I hope that we can come together and move forward on this project and improving downtown. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Rick Longinati. Um, council members, I do believe you all have uh, the best interests of the community at heart and you have good intentions on this project, there's just a major problem, and that is that uh, we've had many consultants, actually the city has hired many consultants to, to advise us, and they've all agreed that a parking garage is not necessary. And most importantly, the city spent $100,000 on the Nelson Nygaard parking study, which concluded that better management of our existing parking is the way to go, an alternative to building new parking. Um, I can't fathom how you can approve money for a project when you haven't even looked at the economics of parking study from Nelson Nygaard. Um, if it happened in any other city in the country, they would call that corruption. You, tonight, if you vote money for this project, you are really sowing seeds of distrust and when the people, you know, I, I, I give you credit for listening to people who are angry who come to the microphone, but that's how it starts with sowing seeds of distrust. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, this is Rachel O'Malley, and um, I just wanted to thank you for your service, um, and I wanted to share that I was walking across the Black Lives Matter mural on the street, and I was absolutely stunned and moved, and I felt so good about this town, and I looked to my left, and I saw the library, and I imagined the library doors opening out onto that Black Lives Matter mural toward the Civic Center, and it made me feel so proud and so happy that we would be reusing an existing building. I also thought about the proposal to build this behemoth at the farmer's market site, which is a site the community comes together. And when you feel that now in this moment of incredible cynicism and incredible distrust of democracy is a time that you could actually show you're not the Republican pushing through Amy Coney Barrett, but instead you are the Santa Cruz City Council listening to the people being respectful of our democracy, respectful of that we voted for Measure S to restore the library. We don't like this bait and switch. So I really want to encourage you to turn this back now. Listen to the people. At least wait till after the election. Just what we're asking the Republicans to do. And you guys are better than the Republicans. Please listen to us now. Let us vote. Let us make this decision for the best of Santa Cruz, not for the best of the money holders and the developers. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, Mayor Cummings and Council members. Uh, this is Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. At what point do you listen to the community's outcry? When does one realize that you are on the council to serve all the people of Santa Cruz? We all have our agendas and specific focus on projects that fit our concerns. These concerns and pet projects must be set aside when you do have to accept compromises that are detrimental to your constituents and are unnecessary. This multi-use project needs to be abandoned due to its addition of a garage, which is unnecessary. Experts have spoken, community has spoken, and the facts telling us parking will be in less demand in the future are three great reasons to move on and work on providing us with a nice library at its present location and affording housing. Please wait till after Thursday's workshop. Thank you. Okay, so if there's any member of the public who has not had a chance to speak yet and would like to speak for one minute, now is the time. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given one minute to speak if you have not spoken already. My name is Rochelle Mavoyan. I uh, had the privilege of sitting on council when this project came before us. I have watched an incredibly open process um, for this. I've watched a citizens review committee with amazingly talented and savvy people come to the conclusion that this project uh, is important and is needed. 
Uh, I've seen a council subcommittee unanimously come together uh, after studying what the DLAC did and came to the same conclusion. We've had several public meetings and to say that this hasn't gone through a public process is just not true. Please approve this contract without further delay. When we say no to a project, we're saying no to people and we have to remember who we're saying no to. I was at Walgreens and talked to a cashier who felt he had won the lotto because he had just gotten one of the affordable units in the new Water Street 100% uh, affordable project. We have to remember folks like him who say he can walk to work down and live in the town he grew up in. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Stephen Speak. Uh, I, voters are wondering, I think, still, why has the measure S bond money, which was almost universally understood at the time of the vote to be used for renovation, being co-opted as part of this garage housing project? Um, we know that $27 million is attractive, but why can't the affordable housing stand on its own? It's a city-owned lot. I would also wonder why can't we expand parking if, in fact, it's proven that we needed it? Uh, why can't we put a second and third level on the church and cedar structure, which is woefully underutilized at two stories? Please hold this on to this action until the city can conduct gen genuine outreach to Santa Cruz City voters so we don't have this split and mistrustful uh, po local politic which we can see demonstrated in Washington, D.C. right now. Don't rush it through when we know that maybe half or maybe far more than half are opposed to this project. Thank you. Okay, next caller, you're being asked to unmute. Good evening. Hi there, good evening, Mayor Cummings and uh, Santa Cruz City Council. My name is Alexia Garcia. I'm the Community Engagement Assistant with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Um, a little bit about us, MBEP was founded in 2015 and consists of over 87 uh, public, private, and civic entities located throughout Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Cruz counties. Um, with a mission to improve economic health and quality of life in the Monterey Bay region. Um, our housing initiative supports the construction of housing in our region at all types and income levels in appropriate locations near existing jobs, transit, and services. Um, our climate, uh, climate change initiative also advocates for the construction of transit-oriented housing developments and climate-resilient infrastructure. And for all these reasons, uh, the proposed library project is in full alignment with our housing production and climate change uh, resiliency goals. We feel that the city has an opportunity to address the community's pressing affordable housing needs while also providing the community with the state-of-the-art library facility. Um, the council should continue to move this important project forward by selecting Griffin Structures as the owner's representative. And I thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, my name is Gillian Greenside, and uh, just quickly to say that I've been opposed to relocating the library from the beginning. Um, I'm one of the people, and I think many in the community, have a, a, a deep sense of sense of place with the library, the civic, and city hall. And to move it is destroying a relationship that we have. And people talk about a modern new building, et cetera. Um, yes, people are entitled to their opinions, but I think that ignores the deep sense of place that we hold for a library in this place. And nothing I've seen so far means that that could
couldn't happen. And just a quick example, the survey that was done originally that got a huge response never asked the question, are you in favour of us relocating the library? Otherwise, I think you would have had a better sense of the community's feeling about this. Please don't approve this. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jim Meckes. I support building the new library and I ask you to award the contract. I grew up in Santa Cruz with the Carnegie Library, but by the mid-60s, it was clearly too small for 30,000 people population. Uh, we're now over 60,000 population, and we've outgrown our current library. Yet one group proposes the best solution is to reduce the size of our current library to address earthquake issues, cut programs by 30% to compensate, and remodel with a lower quality structure. That's not the way to go. Uh, we, need a, the, we need the library. We need parking near Capcart. After learning that we're losing multiple existing lots, including the one across from the farmer's market, and we need affordable housing. This solution addresses all of them, and we should explore uh, and find out what we can achieve. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your, call, your comments. My name is Henry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. The housing crisis is real, and the way to solve the crisis is simply to build housing. Lots of it in places where there's access to public transportation and jobs. The particularly dire need in Santa Cruz is for affordable housing. This project provides at least 50 permanently affordable homes. If we stop now, we lose an immediate opportunity to house people who work here but can't live here. Many of these people live in fire zones in the South County. Let's reduce their commute and help the climate. Providing the housing we need in Santa Cruz will provide ridership for a working public transportation system. In the end, we'll get a more walkable, equitable, sustainable, and vibrant Santa Cruz. Thank you very much. Hello and good evening. Good evening. I am calling in. Good evening. Um, thank you. My name is Bacha Kagan. I'm calling in because of um, I do support affordable housing. We do need more of it. I do support an innovative library, a renovated library. However, I'm concerned why um, there's so many people who are talking about sustainability. And really, when we've spent already $100,000 on a study that said we don't need parking, which does only promote climate um, more climate change, which we've already experienced with the fire. We don't need more of that. Um, I don't know why we're not following a study we've already spent a lot of money on. And I also would like to promote the idea that perhaps a compromise solution would be to put affordable housing there, put uh, the library there, but the only other problem is that the farmer's market would be way too small. I've talked to people at the farmer's market it's not enough room. They have to take all their all their trucks off the lot and then bring them back on. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Jim Jensen. Uh, President of Santa Cruz, um, heavy, heavy library user, and also someone that used to work in that building about 25 years ago. It was a turd then, and you can pour all the money into it, and it's just going to be a shiny, smaller turd. Um, it's, it's in a bad spot. The, the fire detection system sees ghosts. The elevator is out of order most of the time when I was working there. 
I wholeheartedly support the downtown moving the library to there, putting some parking, putting some housing. If you want a city commons, knock that building down and build a plaza in front of city hall. Think of the awesome Greek festival that you can have. Now remember, when you take and you approve a project like this, you get a bronze plaque with the mayor and all the city council members. Do you want it on a modern library that can serve the city and county, or do you want it on a shiny turd? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Ron Pomerantz. Uh, when the plan for a library underneath a six-story, 400-space parking building failed to win community support in the past, affordable housing was tossed into the garage project merely as an attempt to win a fourth vote from you, Mayor Cummings, and present good public relations. There was never any previous plan for this project to include affordable housing. As a matter of fact, Pursuing this project could jeopardize other affordable housing projects whose development should be further along. For example, there's a planned affordable housing project for a promised 200 some odd units at Cathcart in front as a result of Measure O's 15% inclusionary requirements. That was from an approved market rate housing project at Front and Laurel. The work done to move ahead with this project will most likely be left in shelf dust if staff shifts away from this important project with a lot more units and tries to sell you on the one in the parking garage. Ask staff whether the other promised affordable housing projects are in the process of development and how they've affected, how they'll be affected by this parking garage project. Please deny the money. Also a plan that doesn't cannibalize affordable housing already in the pipeline. I thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Okay, next caller, 2080. Sorry, took a few tries to unmute. This is Pauline Seals, Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. Over the past many weeks, I have spoken to hundreds of people about this project, and they're almost universally against it. The last time there was a city council meeting and you allowed unlimited comments, the overwhelming number were against it. The overwhelming number of the emails and letters to your office have been against it. And this is being completely ignored, it's wrong. Also, you're gonna cut down 11 heritage trees beautiful magnolias that could not be replaced in any way whatsoever or transported that could be part of the downtown commons as been previously mentioned. Doing this is just flat wrong. It's been wrong since it was first thought of. Please stop it now. But thank you for listening. Okay, thank you for calling. Okay, so the next speaker will be our last speaker. Um, we <clears throat> actually went over the hour that we were supposed to limit comment to, but I um, want to thank everyone from call, for calling in. And so the next speaker will be our last caller, and then we'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Everyone, this is Chris Crone. I wasn't going to call up until I heard uh, my colleague, former colleague Michelle Naroyan, call. Um, I didn't find the process, the early process of this library garage, an open process. Um, the city manager, when I first came into his office in 2016, he had it up on his board. It was one of his major things. It was a staff-driven project. Um, it never went to a vote of the people. I think an $80 million expenditure for a project like this needs to go to a vote of the people, similar to the uh, 
uh, desalinization plant. This is one of the largest public works projects we would ever put forward to the people. Um, I just would say don't do this right now. Wait till the election. Wait till the election results are in. And I want to thank Sandy Brown and Captain Byers, and I think Justin Cummings, Mr. Mayor, this is in, the ball is in your court right now. I know you know this, and I hope that you think about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, um, we're gonna end public comment and we're gonna bring it back to the council for action and deliberation. So i um, just like to start by seeing if there's any further questions from council members uh, for staff. If, are there any questions that came up during public comment that maybe um, council members wanna have some clarification on? So maybe we can start there and, and if there are no, no questions then we can see if council members have any comments. Council member Golden. I just have a question. So I have heard um, that the people who run the farmer's market actually would prefer to move to the other location and, and make a more permanent home with gazebos and stalls and things like that. And I just want, maybe Martine can answer this. Um, has, or Bonnie, somebody can speak to this. Is this true? Hi, Council Member Golder. Um, I, the farmer's market has not taken a formal position. Um, we have been working with them. We do have funding set aside for the project. We have preliminary designs that we have shared with their board. Um, but they have, and I, I you know, I, I respect their position at this point. They really do not want to get engaged um, at this point. They want the council direction to go forward, and then we will reconvene with them and move the project forward. So that's their official position um, regarding this project, and um, happy to answer any other specific questions that you have. I can add a little bit of background with respect to the farmer's market, just to, uh, again, for background purposes. And so the farmer's market was uh, one of the stakeholders that was in, uh, engaged with very, very early on. Um, with respect to the project uh, moving forward, uh, or at least even bringing it to, to council initially, uh, recognizing that they're a critical asset, uh, an entity in our downtown. Um, and so in initially uh, interacting or engaging the farmer's market, um, they expressed their interest and desire in creating a permanent market uh, in that uh, they recognized that long term they had no permanency where they were and the potential for development that could occur there because there were any number of projects that had been considered for that uh, property. Because uh, that property hasn't always been a parking lot. It used to have buildings on it. And uh, in any case, uh, the farmer's market has expressed a desire and an interest in trying to create a uh, permanent uh, facility that would improve their operations, uh, uh, covering bathrooms uh, and other facilities to assist with their uh, being able to operate. And so uh, they found it to be an opportunity to m improve their operations and to create this permanency, permanency that they seek. So we worked early on with them to do that. And as a result of that, any number of um, money was set aside as, uh, as uh, uh, Director Lipscomb pointed out. And in addition, there were a number of renderings and uh, outlines that were done. A lot of work was done with them to uh, identify a site and to develop the site and to spec it out. And so a lot of work has been done with the farmer's market to uh, ensure that uh, their needs are being met as part of this project. Yeah. If I could just add one more thing to that um, that the city manager mentioned is that one aspect of the permanent structure is the seasonality. And one of the things in the new design um, does allow the farmer's market to have a cover that both serves for surface parking um, when the farmer's market's not in session, um, but also provides cover during the winter months when it's raining. And so that was a particular element that they were pretty excited about um, that is included in the renderings um, that we have um, for the farmer's market. The other thing about lot seven that's really interesting is that we have the opportunity to combine with um, Barry Swinson um, and the LLC that owns um, the parking lot behind Newly for a portion of that lot to expand the actual surface area and then a line at the southern end near Cathcart into the street for street closure that 
uh, continues on with the Paseo that connects to the Riverwalk. And so that's one of the, you know, exciting elements that Council did approve as part of the downtown plan are these connectivity points to the river. And by having the farmer's market there, we connect actually to the private development that has that 60-foot plaza that goes straight up. So Cathcart would continue on on market days and have that whole street closure area all the way up to the Riverwalk, which is pretty exciting. Councilman Regal, did you have any other questions? I, well, I'm prepared to make a motion, and I fully understand how controversial this project is, and the reality is this, this site had buildings at one time, and ultimately moving forward with this project will help with the big picture projects downtown that we've already been approving, and um, councils have approved before me. And expanding the footprint of downtown to the river and making it part of our city center, and. I constantly walk along the river levee and think it's super underutilized and thinking we could make it more beautiful and moving the farmer's market to a permanent location and create a plaza space on Front Street and connecting it to the river um, creates a more pedestrian friendly downtown. And I love the idea of expanding into the streets and maybe eliminating some of the surface parking that we currently have um, on either Cathcart or Pacific or Front. and. Um, the reality is not everyone has the privilege of being able to bike to our downtown businesses and people that live downtown might also need cars. And so from my perspective, I'm sorry if some voters felt misled, but the ballot, clay, uh, ballot statement says new construction is a possibility from 2016. And I'm constantly rereading those ballot statements because they're persuasive and written deliberately to be vague. And um, I also, you know, walked for this and had a sign in my yard and uh, voted for this and paid for it every year. And so I am prepared to make a motion to award the contract um, for the mixed use library owners representative for phase one to Griffin Structures in the amount of up to 240000 and authorize the city manager to execute an agreement in a form to be approved by the city attorney. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion um, to move the staff recommendation by Council Member Golder, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. Um, Council Member Byers, I saw your hand up. Oh, you're muted, Catherine. Um, I just got to go back to the farmer's market for a second. I met with them the day after all of the officers questioning what did this last vote mean, which was September, I think, 22nd. They have not taken a position on it, and I think that is the bottom line. And you haven't heard from them, and, and, and nor would they. They're appropriate. It wouldn't be appropriate for them to go fighting for something particular. So I just want to thank them for doing what any nonprofit like that should do in this situation. I have a question for Tony, uh, our city attorney. Is it there, Tony? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Normally, I would have given you a heads up on this question, but um, this has, will be part of where I'm going in my answer. I don't think I sure. You probably all know I haven't changed my mind. Last time, 18, I, I read into the record the words of the measure. And we all know it's 18,000 plus 800 or 80 voted for, very popular, absolutely. And it used renovate or restore. I don't have it in front of me this time. I don't think I need it again. How, how did we leap to a new library in a new location? Now, I know uh, Councilman Boulder about that, but that, those words about, it said, if necessary, construction, long way away from, so I just, I, I, I'm looking at the legal part of it. How can we, when 18,000 yeah. people, we don't know how they voted, so I'm just saying, but it did pass overwhelmingly. I mean, I think, uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, quite honestly, uh, Council Member Byers, uh, I wish you had brought that question. I, Tony, I can't hear you very well. Something's wrong. Can you hear me now? Better, better, thanks. Okay, yes. So, um, quite honestly, 
Honestly, if that had question had uh, come to my attention ahead of the meeting, I would have said, uh, I, I would review the language of the ballot measure, but um, assuming that it is as uh, Council Member Golden represents, and I have no, and, and that is consistent with my recollection, then I don't believe that the City Council is constrained legally to utilize the funding from the ballot measure exclusively for a renovation of the existing library. And, and again, um, I did not review that in advance of this meeting because the question wasn't posed to me, but um, that's my recollection is that we were not specifically pinned down to utilize the funding only for a renovation. If we were, then that would be a problem. But if the, if the language is broad enough to uh, encompass, um, you know, just improving library facilities, which is kind of how I recall the language, then I think we're probably in a solid position to do that. Well, if I could, uh, if I, I think, uh, it seems to take you two minutes to bring up that, that the, the language. It does say construction if necessary. It really does. So I go. Somebody should be able to get to that in two minutes. Please, fine. That, and that, I didn't even bring it up at the last one. Yeah, and I and I think that I mean to me that's satisfactory for the council. I mean that's satisfactory to confer upon the city council the legal discretion to make a determination. If it's fine, good. Good. And so I think. And if I can add some background too, uh, just because I was involved in the actual development of the ballot measure, both before it was actually placed with respect to the polling, with respect to the budget, with respect to the negotiations with the county on the various levels of funding, and in addition, the basis for the whole ballot measure. And so one of the things that the library system was doing prior to the ballot measure, which actually led to the development of the ballot measure was the creation right, right. of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries National plan. And that master plan looked at various approaches and options for renovating and or rebuilding the various branches throughout the system. With respect to the city libraries, it looked at um, multiple options. Uh, and with respect to the downtown branch, it looked at a mixed-use project option. And uh, if you go back and look at the master plan that was adopted back in 2013, again, before the uh, the ballot measure was put in place, we had actually looked at uh, some mixed-use projects downtown. One uh, that was, for example, that was looked at was the, uh, uh, actually at the Metro project. Uh, so th that was contemplated as part of the measure that there would be a uh, uh, new construction, uh, some libraries that was the only option, and also that there would have to be uh, different approaches to try to make the budgets work because the ballot measure itself was not going to generate sufficient revenue uh, to be able to do the new construction and the full renovation of all the branches. So we expected that we would have to look at a various options with respect to particularly the downtown. Um, and so again, the mixed use option was something that was contemplated even before the ballot measure was put in place as a, as a potential option. Well, I understand that, Martine. Contemplated before the ballot measure is one thing. We're looking at what people voted on well, and, and all their best, they have a ballot in front of them, you need the ballot, it isn't what all the work was. I was on the library board up until almost 12, 13, and I know the, that point, but we have to look at the words, so it doesn't right. matter what all the background the, is. The wording was drafted in order to provide I, for all of those options, so that's, well, that's look, what I'm getting at. That, it was specifically prepared because in that way, because that was contemplated, there would be no construction. And all I'm asking is somebody look at the language about if necessary, because nobody has proved that it is necessary. So anyway, I'm, I, I suspect somebody will look at it. I expect somebody will call me back or Tony will get on it before we close tonight. So I'll just go on. First of all, I want to thank um, my comments. Uh, Bonnie, uh, thank you for the great presentation. You and your assistant, uh, I'm sorry, Amanda. Um, it's just what we needed. Uh, uh, 
a month ago or maybe even that long on the 22nd because you gave us what was in the contract what we wanted you know we sputtered about that and we also got all the background and the and the on the consultant so good job and i thank you for putting up with this and bringing it forward i think it was very very helpful and very useful that isn't gonna make me vote for it i think you already know i still i am not going to uh I, I so believe in what the people voted on and what they thought they were doing, and I think we're playing tricks on them. And uh, I have never, all the big issues I've been involved in, never have I gotten as many email with the community bringing up the ballot measure or asking us, please don't. They love their library. Um, so I, I, again, will have to vote you know, moving forward. Um, I just want to make a couple comments real quick uh, before we continue on. And one of it is that you know I think that the that we, we should stay focused on the conversation tonight, which is largely around the adoption and awarding the contract. Um, you know it was pretty clear that at the last meeting there was a desire to have a contract come back with actual numbers, timelines, how's the money being spent, and also additional information on the financing for how do you make affordable housing work, parking, what's the library funding. And so I want to thank the staff, as you know, as our buyer said, I want to thank you all for doing that. And um, just to one other comment on public process, you know, I think it was pointed out at the beginning of this conversation that, you know, public process has gone back to, two, to 2017 for outreach and engagement with the community on getting input on these projects. And, you know, uh, I spent, you know, over a year with Council Member Myers, or Vice Mayor Myers and Council Member Brown doing extensive community outreach, and we took, um, you know, a number of days where we were evaluating which was the best option, and we unanimously agreed um, before we came to council that moving forward with a new library was the best option. And then, in addition to that, we're trying to figure out how we could meet the needs. Of, you know, what are some other needs for the downtown that we could potentially incorporate into this? And knowing that there is a need, if we're going to put in housing, there's a need for parking. We're getting rid of you know over 100 spaces on that lot, which means you're going to have to replace those. I think that we're you know working in the best interest of our community to try to bring forward something that uh, you know people um, that we could find consensus on. So we listen. I definitely heard when I was running for city council that having a 600 six-story parking garage on top of the library was something the community didn't want. And we eliminated that as an option. And yes, people were, are correct in saying that affordable housing was not initially um, proposed in this project. But one of the things through going through this process is that there actually, you know, wasn't there, there wasn't a plan or a design that was finalized for the space. And that's part of what we're doing with hiring these consultants is we're trying to figure out with the finances that we have, the space that we have. And with what the, what we've identified is what is what the community wants. How can we make that happen on this space? And it's going to require professionals to be involved with this. If you go on Griffin Structures website, um, I think I can't remember the name of the city, but if you click on their tab for affordable housing, they were able to um, in another city of California build 120 affordable units with their library project, their mixed use project, and so. My hope is that the one thing I'd like to ask, well, I don't know if it needs to be included in the motion or if it can just be a recommendation to the staff, but I think we should emphasize that the 50 affordable units are the minimum and we should try to maximize the affordable housing and additionally that this housing, that the affordable housing is deed restricted in perpetuity so that we can ensure that the affordable housing that is going into this project is permanent support uh, affordable housing. So Bonnie, I don't know if you could speak to that or if that needs to be included in the motion, but I know we've, we've expressed that we want to maximize affordable housing, but no less than 50 units. So 
Yeah, I, I believe that the previous motion said a minimum of 50 units, but that is our that is our goal is to come back to you with options that show how many units we can actually have on the site and have and have feedback from you. And I, I think part of that also is going to be dependent on um, if uh, council wants to consider um, you know the height limitation. So we're we're that's going to be part of what we'll come back to you with is how many traditionally we can fit on the site under the current zoning and then some additional options for you to consider and then also looking at additional funding to help subsidize that that additional gap so those that's all part of the funding um, considerations will be that we'll bring back to you we do recognize with this being a city-owned site and city-owned you know parking lots in the parking district that we want to maximize the potential of every site that's under city control so we would like to maximize that as well and that will be part of our goals that we bring back as far as deed restriction we deed restrict all projects that have city funding in them and particularly affordable housing funding they will be including state and federal sources which also have deed restrictions typically it's 45 and 55 years um, on some city projects we have done in perpetuity so those will be a guarantee with city state and funding in the projects which will absolutely be necessary for them to be financially feasible thank you well i think that you know and again, I want to thank the staff for, I think, meeting um, some of the concerns that I have. And I guess one other question, in the, um, in the report that came forward within the contract, there were timelines built in around financing and then when, you know, the different phases for design. And, and so I was just curious, it, it seemed like um, the financing piece was going to take about four months to come back, and that was kind of stage one. So I was just curious when we might be able to expect, if we award the contract today, when should we expect, you know, the first kind of update on financing or what have you? Oh, you're muted, Bonnie. I was saying I'm actually looking to Amanda, who's very familiar with the, with the project components. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so the timeline that we proposed is a sort of rough estimate that uh, Griffin put together as part of their proposal. Um, part of the very first phase of their sort of work with us will be an onboarding where we get them up to speed, we get them, <clears throat> pardon me, all the information that they need. And at that time, we would put together a more firm budget, you know, budget and timeline, which we would come back to you with. Um, in terms of, you know, some of those more detailed financing numbers, um, as we said earlier, a lot of that's going to be dependent on the, the, the design process and coming up with a final design. So our, um, our plan would be to, once we've if and once we've hired on Griffin as our owner's rep, we would come back to you with sort of our overall project timeline and budget. Um, but the proposal that they put together is sort of built off of their expertise and how they've seen projects going. Um, obviously, we've seen a significant delays with this project, and so, you know, timelines are um, very fluid. And, uh, you know, with this, you know, as we delayed this item coming back, that, you know, there are just small delays that happen along the way. Um, so the project, the, the calendar will be ever-changing, but we'll really be looking to bring you regular updates on where we are in the project and what next steps you can expect and um, having regular check-ins. Um, I think it just, and this is, uh, this is my last comment, but I think it would be good if, um, whether it's the first meeting in January or the second, it would be good to have an update, especially for the new council coming in um, on kind of where this is at and, you know, just so, and so the community has also a good sense of the timeline and what are the next steps and when can we expect, because I know that a lot of folks um, in our community are going to be wondering, when are we going to hear back about all these different pieces and when are we going to know more to know where we're going? And so I think you know, Absolutely. to the extent we can have an update um, early in 2021, I think it would be really helpful. I will say one of the things that we really liked about Griffin's approach to communication is they have built in these regular timelines for updating various stakeholders. So, you know, have re regular intervals that um, updates go would go to city council and the community and internal staff working on the project. Um, you know, they will bring on this capacity and ability to do that, which has been just a challenge for myself and trying to get communication out and keep all the balls in the air. So having that extra help and having that commitment from them to help with communications, um, I, I think we're going to see a lot more communication coming out about this project. So it's one of the things that we were really excited about as staff was um, having 
team members who are going to do that. So we'll be keeping the project page updated, and you'll also be getting regular updates as part of their scope. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers, then Council Member Golder, and then Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and give up my spot. Um, several of my questions were answered tonight, so thank you. Okay, Council Member Golder. I just wanted to answer um, Council Member Byers and say I found the information I was referring to just on the public library's website. They had the ballot language there, and it was on page three. And I just pulled it up right now, and it says. Um, in under fiscal impact statements of measure S, the second paragraph, it says special tax uh, proceeds, blah, 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 has the things laid out and then it says, this shall include without limitation, new construction, building renovations and service model upgrades, such as separate areas for teen and children, flexible spaces and or meeting rooms and study rooms, flooring, painting, et cetera. And so if you wanna see it, it's on, that's where you can find that. And um, to, uh, uh, Mayor Cummings and Reggie Meister, I um, I agree that we should try to keep the units as deed restricted as possible, but um, in I don't know what that would mean in perpetuity. So I think moving forward, I just try to think we want to the intent we can maximize affordability um, in the recommendation. I think that. I mean, you know, we don't know, like if this building's gonna need to be, <laughs> we're building it now, but it could be need to be renovated in 50 years or 100 years. And so I just wanna try and keep it as clean as possible and um, the motion as clean as possible and say, um, keep it as it is, but um, just have the intent be that um, obviously we wanna keep the units as affordable as possible for as long as possible. I don't know how to, Say that maybe um, Bonnie can help me out. Bonnie, did you want to comment? Like, my understanding was that I think you clarified that you know when cities when cities build affordable housing and when they have state funding, then they it's typically a minimum of forty five and fifty five years, and it, it's one of the reasons is exactly for the reason you mentioned, Councilmember Golder, and that that's typically a lifespan of a project. Um, and uh, in perpetuity um, is just meaning that as long as that project is standing, it's gonna continue to be affordable. Um, so that is it, generally one or the other for all projects that have city, state, and federal funding. It's either gonna be the 45, 55 years, depending on if it's rental or for sale um, and or in perpetuity. So it sounds like it will be included. It will. So we don't need to like put it explicitly. Okay. So I don't think at this point we need to mention that. I just want to keep the motion as it is, if that's okay. Yeah, I guess I would just point out that um, I, I think that's a valid question. But the item before you is really just to award the contract for the um, uh, owner's representative services. Mm -hmm. And so when and if that becomes an issue, we can bring it back to the council for uh, formal direction on that. On that issue. Okay, sorry for asking a bad question. Let's just keep it how it was. I'll keep my motion as it was. <laughs> Tony, Tony, for clarification with the public, since we're we're discussing the contract tonight, we're not discussing the affordable housing and what that's going to be and what percentage. And as a result, we don't need to have, go into those conversations around in perpetuity or verse or 50 years. But I think it's. I think the point that I was trying to bring up is that for staff to understand that obviously we want to maximize long-term affordable housing and so in perpetuity is obviously where we want to go, but it's just a, a note and like a recommendation, so. Yeah, and I think that's a perfectly appropriate to note that for the record, but you're correct, the item before you is really just to approve this uh, contract uh, for the owner's representative Okay. Uh, the Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Thank you. I have a, another question for Bonnie, um, who by now is probably sick of my questions, but um, I, the question that I have right now is related to, and I think I sent it, but I don't recall um, what the response was. For, and, and I know that we're talking about the contract, but I just want to understand for the affordable housing component, 
um, if we are to have, if it is going to be a city uh, subsidized project, can you get, can a developer get tax credits for a project that is not 100% affordable? Um, is that, I mean, because I, I might, as I, we've discussed, there's the possibility for market housing in there as well. And is that, um, can that yes. be done? They can, um, they can, but I think how we would approach it actually is two distinct projects within the project. So if, you know, we are looking at having, if we are looking at having a market rate component as one of the options to help provide funding um, to expand the library, then we would potentially look at that as a separate project. Um, so that it would be a little cleaner on the, on the financing. Um, and if I could, um, I just make my comments now while I have the floor, um, and I'll try to stick to the, the topic at hand here. Um, I guess, so we hear from, I just have been thinking about this as we've listened to the you know public speakers uh, very articulately uh, talk about their uh, positions, and we hear from people who are most engaged, you know, proponents, opponents, people who are really following this. I really appreciate that there are so many people in our community who care enough to do this, and I really appreciate the time that staff has taken to uh, try to respond to our questions and concerns, and uh, particularly around the affordable housing financing piece tonight. That was exact. I mean, I've been um, kind of wishing that we had that information or that kind of scenario mapped out for us for a long time now, so thank you for all of that work you've put in. Um, so we hear from people who are really engaged, and I think as you know, we tend to kind of sit in our silos and, and talk to our friends and our political allies who have those strong positions. Um, but what I have had an opportunity to, over the past uh, month or so now, to talk to a lot of voters, and um, and I continue to believe that uh, the community concerns about this are, um, are you know are real and that they need to be addressed and um, and I just feel like that you know the public really deserves some uh, representation of what I believe is a, um, a pretty widespread position opposing this project in this iteration um, so uh, you know I can't support moving forward I'm sorry um, that I'm not able to do that um, and you know I just uh, you know, I just hope that we, you know, I, I think that um, as uh, Mr. Longinati said, you know, sowing the seeds of doubt and, I mean, voter trust has, is an issue that's come up for, with people that I've been talking to a lot. And these are not people I know, these are not people who have some prescribed seeds ready or, you know, they're, they really are just um, not, it's not what they thought they were voting for. So um, given that, I, I can't support the motion uh, before us. Um, and I, at the same time, will look forward to hearing, um, you know, hearing back from the from the uh, developer um, owner agent. I think we're calling it uh, in the future. Thanks. All right. Are there any further comments from council members, Vice Mayor Myers? Um. Well, I was going to call the question, I think, probably, but I, let's, I, I was just thinking maybe we should just call the question and, and move forward. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even think there's a need to call the question. I, I think okay. we're done comments. So if no one has a further com any further comments, I think um, we can just ask the clerk to, um, to do the roll call vote. So before us, we have a motion by Councilmember Golder, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers to adopt the staff recommendation to award the contract for the mixed-use library owners representative for phase one to Griffin Constructions Incorporated in the amount up to $240,000 and authorize the city manager to execute, execute an agreement in a form to be approved by the city attorney. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers. Oh, you're muted, Catherine. No. no. Councilmember Matthews is disqualified. Councilmember Brown? No. Boulder? 
Council Member Gold. No, no. Oh. no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No. No, no. you mean yes. No. <laughs> What? <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was distracted. I was taking a drink of my water. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Councilmember Watkins. <laughs> you, you uh, shifted me. Mute you yourself. <laughs> I, I, I got it. <laughs> sorry, Councilmember Watkins. Oh, yeah. yeah. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers. Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. So that passes with Council Members Golder, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, Mayor Cummings voting in favor, um, Council Member Brown and Byers voting opposed, and Council Member Matthews disqualified. Okay, so with that, um, that concludes our city council meeting. So for members of the public, we do have a special city council meeting, which is our interim recovery planning meeting this Thursday. Um, and maybe could the city, if the city managers are, could you just remind us of what time that's at? Yes, I believe that starts at uh, three o'clock. Let me just double make sure here. The interim recovery plan workshop is, yes, three o'clock. Okay, so if members of the public are interested in joining us at that meeting, you can find the information for that meeting on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. And uh, with that, I'll see you all on Thursday. Have a good evening. Thank you.